good afternoon uh, respected members again afternoon session we have uh, renowned speaker c e narendra jain ji i request ranjit amir please please come forward and uh, Archin, Archin, Amir. Please present the bouquet, and we all together welcome him. this and it is important for us to understand this 
and then we will be able to do an analysis which can t stand the test of arms length price. So, what I have uh, given, I mean, I think the economic comparability analysis is already done in the first hour. So, there could be, what I am doing is the functional analysis and economic adjustment. So, there could be some points which could be repeated, but that for the sake of completeness, it is necessary that we look at those aspects again. The functional analysis, what we look at under rule 10b and rule 10c forms the core of the transfer pricing framework. We will try to draw reference to OECD transfer pricing guidelines and rule 10b and 10c which give us the framework in terms of how we are going to do the transfer pricing analysis. And under rule 10b, 10b2, there are four aspects, specific characteristics of property transfer, function, asset, risk, functions performed, assets employed and risks undertaken, contractual terms and market conditions. So we have these four parameters which the law provides us and within these four parameters we need to do the analysis. If you look at OECD, there is another line item called as business strategies that is not being incorporated in rule 10b2 but however I think that that should not make a major difference. These four are good enough to cover various aspects that we have to deal with during the transfer pricing analysis. The transfer pricing when it was introduced in 2001 by Finance Act 2001 was more of an anti-evasion tool. It was meant that that what base India's tax base is eroding to stop that because with that objective it was inserted. But over the years the transfer pricing has got converted into the tax collection mechanism. So you find that the tax authorities are aggressive in terms of doing transfer pricing addition because it comes as a target and how much tax collection you are going to do. So tax evasion methodology is always meant only to deter and it is not a tax collection mechanism but from the objective what it was inserted it is moved to a different dimension. And to, to fight that dimension of department's approach in terms of tax collection ultimately you have to consider and convert every analysis into a number and if you don't convert, suppose I am saying that this is a difference but if I don't convert, convert that difference into a numerical number that is of no use. So we need to understand that how am I going to do the analysis and whether I can convert that analysis into a numerical figure which can stand the test of arms length price and the principle laid down under rule 10b and rule 10c. So if I don't do that there is no way that I am going to get an adjustment or I am able to say that my functional analysis is correct. Right? So, the transfer pricing over the years has become a cold and brutal story of numbers. Ultimately, it all boils down to the numbers that you are able to reflect in your study or whether the revenue is able to reflect in its in his order. So, we will try to see how this analysis, if we are able to convert into a number and how we can analyze that, use that for the purpose of our study as well as our assessments. This is broad uh, analysis in broad steps in terms of what we do during the course of transfer pricing and functional analysis and economic adjustment, the topics which I deal, comes at possibly two stages. So if I say that how I am going to do a transfer pricing study, we are going to identify the transaction, I am going to look whether the transactions are closely related, right, rule 10, uh, rule 10 capital A clause T provides that transaction includes closely linked transaction. So many times you will find out that the transactions are linked. So when you are identifying the transactions, we need to identify whether the transactions are linked. The classic examples are razor and blade because razor is sold at a lesser price and then you really make money in the blade or you sell the printer at a lesser price and really make, you really make money in the cartridge. So printer and cartridge model what we say. Or it could be a car sales where you sell the car at a nominal profit but you know that you are going to make profit in the post sale service. So that distributor knows that this guy is going to come to me. So he may be ready to forego certain profits at the time of the sale of car. Similarly, it could happen if the person who is giving royal, uh, technical know-how may expect that the raw material or the poor components are always purchased from that person. So when these kind of transactions are there, our analysis has, our functional analysis should say that these are combined transactions because we cannot make an independent analysis of this. I mean, really make a loss in a printer and make a profit in a cartridge. 
So is that offsetting transaction or bundle transactions? So that analysis is important part of the transfer pricing study. Then comes the function asset risk. That is what we see is what is functions perform assets uh, employed and risks assumed. So this is what our rule prescribes under rule 10p and rule 10c. So this is a functional analysis that we are going to do during the course of study. We will deal with, it, deal with this in detail as we proceed further. Though people try to say that this should be extended further, it should become farm. From far it should become farm. Function, asset, risk and market. That is the way it is the consumer. That, all, that analysis also should come into the analysis. Currently our rule do not provide for this. The, the uh, OECD guidelines or other guidelines do not provide for it. It's only a concept that when you are comparing geographical market should be there. But this concept of farm is more relevant, especially in digital economy kind of thing or virtual uh, sales kind of thing because we are the consumer is at a different place, the activities are happening at a different place and you may want to really try and attribute the profits at where the consumer is there. So if from that perspective this becomes an important thing. But as of now because the rules and regulations today only talk of farm, we we'll restrict our study or analysis to those part. <coughs> Then we try to identify who is tested party, from whose margins or price you are going to test and then we are going to look at what are the comparables. Now there we will see what is the what is the most appropriate method, what are the comparables. Comparables could be internal comparables, comparables could be external comparables. These aspects are already dealt and we need not go into that. But while we have selected the comparables, when you have selected the method and selected the comparable, the aspect of functional analysis also comes back. That is another point that we will deal as we go further. So functional analysis is a two-step process. One is your own transaction and one is that when you are comparing with the comparables, what functional analysis you are going to do. So it's not one-step transaction. General understanding it is a one-step transaction. But it is not one step. It is two-step. The functional analysis is a two-step study that we have to do and not one step. Many times we stop at one step and don't go to the second step. This is where we face the difficulty. Then naturally the last, last part is conclusion. I am going to compute the ELP and decide whether the transactions are at arm's length or not. So what is PLI? PLI is profit level indicator. This is, we use it when we are applying the methods like TNMM, transaction net margin method. So you have a, especially in TNMM, you have a flexibility to adopt what could be your base, numerator and denominator. So the denominator is driven by what kind of transaction you are having. Suppose you are rendering the services to your A, you would take the cost as the denominator. Because the, if you get there, you cannot take sales as a denominator. So you would say, say net profit or operating profit by cost when you are rendering services. When you are purchasing the raw material, you are going to say net profit by sales. This is the reason that both numerator and denominator should be possibly, especially the denominator should be uncontrolled. If I put, if I am rendering services and I take sales as a denominator in my PLI, then the, the transaction, the sale itself is tainted. I want to arrive at a correct sale and if that itself is a part of the PLI, then the PLI will be tainted, which will not use a correct result. So that, that, that part comes in when we are looking at the methods. Now coming to the uh, OECD guidelines, our rules, rule 10b2, Rule 10 b 3 and Rule 10 c 2 These are three important rules from functional analysis and economic adjustment perspective. These are three rules which we have to try to understand. Rule 10 b one deals with the methods and how are you going to apply the method to compute the ELP. Rule 10 b 2 says us what are the characteristics, the functional characteristics that we are going to look at while doing the functional analysis. Rule 10 b 3 talks of the adjustments. And rule 10c2 gives us the guidelines that we have to look at while we are doing the selecting the most appropriate method. These three sub rules put together, and if you look at the OECD, the, the, it is almost at a similar plane because when we drafted the rules, we had took huge amount of uh, reference from the OECD and other global legislations. So our rules and OECD are at, at, at very similar level, we can say. And understanding OECD as well as understanding your rule will give us an insight into what the functional analysis and what economic adjustments are. So now, first step, first thing that we need to understand is when I will do a functional analysis, when I have to do a functional analysis, and what are the things I have to take care of when I am doing a functional analysis. Now, rule 10b2 gives us the features in terms of what I am going to do as a functional analysis. OECD guidelines 2017 says, first you need to identify what are financial in your transactions, what are your financial and commercial relationship. 
with your associated enterprise, financial and commercial relationship with your associated enterprise. So I need to identify, first point is I need to identify that what are my financial or commercial relationships with my associated enterprise. It could be in the form of a written agreement in contractual terms or it could be certain cases unwritten agreement. So it could be coming as a service, it could be coming as a payment of your expenditure or products or royalty or etc. So first I need to identify what are in these transactions, what I am doing, what are the financial and commercial arrangements between the SSE and the related party. So this is the first level. Now whatever we talk of international transaction will also be applicable to SDT, specific domestic transaction because the rule, uh, whenever when they inserted SDT in 2012, they just said wherever international transaction was there, they added or SDT. So there is not much of a change from our perspective from understanding. So it will be applicable, equally applicable whether it is for international transaction or for the specified domestic transaction. So first thing I am going to do is find out what are my international transactions and what are the the financial and commercial relationship I am having with the associated enterprise. That is the first aspect. Now, as I said, the functional analysis is two-step activity. Okay. The OECD guidelines 2017 would say, you, you first what you identify, financial and commercial relationship, you compare this with uncontrolled transaction. That means, I will do functional analysis, me vis-a-vis -vis my E, and I will do functional analysis, me vis-a-vis -vis my comparables. So I need to do two, I need to keep these two things in the mind. So first when I am doing my functional analysis with the associate vis-a-vis related party, my associate enterprise, the holding company and subsidiary, you will identify what is the characteristics of the subsidiary. Suppose subsidiary is in India, suppose we take a simple example of rendering services, software services or ITI services or market services, marketing services. What I am going to do is I am going to say that the look, this is my subsidiary, this subsidiary is doing so and so activity. It is doing contract service rendering. The IP is held by my holding company and I am rendering the services to it. So this is functional analysis vis-a-vis -vis holding company and subsidiary. Right? Then I need to do a functional analysis associate vis-a-vis -vis the comparables. That means I need to say that my what I have identified that I am a contract service provider, I need to identify similar comparables who are doing contract service provider. This is an important sub, sub part of it, second step of it, which we should keep it in mind. That what are, that the functional analysis has to be two step. One, the associate vis-a-vis -vis the related party. Second, associate vis-a-vis -vis the comparables. These both aspects are dealt in rule 10b2, 10b3 vis-a-vis the rule 10c2. If you, and when I am doing this analysis, at the first, first we will focus on the first analysis. That when I am doing the analysis between me and my holding company, what are the things that I am going to say, going to look at. Look at a simple example which UN model gives, UN TP uh, manual gives. Suppose there are three companies in a group, C1, C2, C3. C1 is doing R&D, C2 is doing manufacturing, C3 is doing marketing. So these are three functions, three different entities are doing in the in the MN group, multinational group. Now, each of these can be structured in a different way. For example, first we take in a situation where the company which is doing R&D owns the IP. Okay, so it does the research and development, funds the research and development, takes the risk of developing the IP, and upside or downside of that IP is with the company one, C1. So the company two, C2, its job is manufacturing. So C1 will give the IP for exploitation to C2 and C2 becomes a licensed manufacturer. Right? So C2 will take the technology or IP from C1 and do its manufacturing activity and give it to C3 who will do marketing and sales. So in this first example, C1 plays a critical role of development of IP, doing developing the IP and taking the risk associated with the IP. Right? Upside and downside risk associated with the IP. Now you change this. If you say that Look, in a situation where, suppose C2 was the person who was funding the development of IP. So that means C2 is the owner of the IP, it will give funds to C1 and C1 then becomes a contract R&D which will do the development of the IP and C2 role will immediately change from a licensed manufacturer to a full-fledged manufacturer who is owning the IP, doing the R&D, taking the risk of IP, doing the manufacturing activity and giving to the distributor C3 which will do the marketing. This can further be changed to say that IP is owned by C3. 
So then the C3 will be funding C1 and C2, C1 for doing the R&D activity, C2 to do the manufacturing activity and C3 will own the IP and C3 will do the marketing and keep the profits with it. Right? So in a multinational group, it is always possible to identify, we have to identify where are, what are the, what is the value chain in whole supply chain, where is the value residing. So what is the supply chain? In our example, the supply chain is R&D, manufacturing, marketing and sales. Right? All three entities are doing this different activity. And the, the activities are segregated between three different organizations. So this has to be identified as a part of the functional analysis. We cannot just say that Indian company is doing manufacturing and R&D compared with manufacturing in all the three circumstances. In first and third circumstances, say Indian company was doing manufacturing but it is a licensed manufacturer. In the circumstances too, it is a full-fledged manufacturer. So the return, risk, reward will all differ. Similarly, if I take situation 3, where there is a marketing company in India, it is not doing just marketing, it is funding the R&D and funding the manufacturing also. So you cannot just compare that with any other trading company. Okay, so I have to, as a first step, I will, I, I will try to identify what are financial and commercial relationship between the group, between the three parties of the group. Here three parties, there could be two parties, there could be four parties. Whatever are the facts of a case, one needs to identify and delineate those from the financial and commercial relationship between the group. That is the first step of the analysis. And to do that step, we have uh, four parameters given in well, Rule 10 b 2 Those four parameters like specific characteristics of property plus function asset plus, those have to be kept in mind. Once I have done and identified these financial and commercial relationship, then I will see whether the financial and commercial relationship in controlled transaction are similar to uncontrolled transaction, which could be internal comparables or external comparables. So this is how the sequence or this is how the thought process of ours should be in terms of when we are doing the functional analysis. And how do we go about identifying this? What is the step for us to go and identify? How do I identify who is running the IP? How do I identify uh, who is doing the manufacturing activity? Naturally this information is with the assessing. Okay? So one can design a questionnaire of that sort to say that I want to identify this. The starting point always is the written agreement between the related parties. That is the starting point. OECD commentary says as you proceed further we will see that your contractual terms are starting point for you to do the analysis. So whenever you are doing the analysis, first we need to have the contractual arrangement. In, then we need to see whether the conduct is in accordance with the agreement. If the conduct is different, agreement is different, then it's a different issue. But for us to start with, why is the group chart is the agreement between the parties, relationship between the parties, who is funding the, uh, uh, the uh, development activities. So these are certain important parameters. This information we need to take and analyze from the associate to understand that what is the functional role of the Indian associate who is, whose, whose uh, transactions we are certifying through Form 3 CV. Okay. So this functional analysis is the first part or so that is the first thing that we have to keep it in mind. So while doing this, also uh, another important point that we have to keep it in mind is because of if the organization is a bigger organization more than 500 crores because master file becomes applicable to them, this information may also be available in the master file. The rule 10DA today provides that the, as a part of master file you will give your supply chain, you will give your important products, what are 10 important the products contributing more than 10% of revenue. You will give the function asset risk analysis of major revenue generators in the group. So this information today can be available with you in terms of what master file the SSE has prepared. And it is important that if different persons are doing this, we need to ensure that what we see in both these forms is same. Because uh, the, both these documents will be with the tax authorities and there should not be any inconsistency consistency in these documents. So if the, if the rule 10 TA is applicable to you, then in those cases, the master file also will give you this initial information to identify who are the entities doing, what is the role of each entity in the group, what is the role of each entity in the group. So that information can also be pulled out currently from a master file, which is applicable if the turnover at the consolidated group level is more than 500 crores and Indian international transactions are 50 crores in case of other transaction, 10 crores in case of intangibles. So that information has to be taken by the SSC. Another point that we 
point it before we proceed into the specifics is the industry in which the SSC operates. This is anyway part of Rule 10D which says that you will document in the industry which operates because in different industries, different functions have different effect. So there could be industry in FMCG industry where marketing is very critical and there could be some other industry where marketing is not critical. So when you are characterizing the Indian company's role, when you are characterizing the functional analysis of the Indian company's role, you need to be aware that what is the industry in which the SSC operates, what is the industry in which the group is operating and what are the important factors in that industry which impacts its profit or margin. Okay? And that fact, those aspects need to be given weighted when we do the functional analysis. So there could be industries where marketing may not be relevant, there could be industries where R&D is not relevant, if I go to generic pharma drug, R&D is really not very critical because you need to, you have the formula in open space. If you are, you are looking at certain types of industries, R&D may not be important and if Indian company is doing that R&D, you will not give more weightage to that. It could be reverse when R&D is important. So these, uh, in the industry also should be kept in mind when doing the functional analysis. Now, if you come to Rule 10C, it says nature and class of transaction, class and class of associate and enterprise entering into the transaction and functions performed by them taking into account assets employed or to be employed or risks assumed by the enterprise. What This is what we call as the FAR, functional asset risk, given a statutory recognition under Rule 10C. And degree of comparability existing between transaction with related parties and uncontrolled transaction and between enterprise and into such transactions. So these two highlighted portions which are there, these are to give us an indication in terms of what I am going to do. I am going to do functional analysis first between me and my related party, second between me and the comparables. Same thing is given in rule 10b2, the second bullet there, functions performed taking into assets employed or employed risks assumed or by the respective parties in the transaction. That is more of the functional analysis, but these four parameters we have to keep it in mind. Specific characteristics of property transfer, contractual terms and condition prevailing in the market. These, each of these factors, we will take it in detail as we proceed further. Now, yeah, Rule 10b3, this is also again important. Rule 10b3 says that an uncontrolled transaction would be comparable for the purpose of ALP if the following conditions are satisfied. None of the differences, if any, between the transaction being compared and between the enterprise entering into such transaction are likely to materially affect the price or cost charged or paid or profit arising from such transaction in the open market or reasonable accurate adjustment can be made to eliminate the material difference effects of such differences. So what Rule 10 3 guides us is that you have identified uncontrolled transaction. The question is, is there difference between controlled transaction and uncontrolled transaction? These differences could be enterprise level differences or transaction level differences. Transaction level differences are the difference in the transaction like FOB, CIF, it's a transaction level differences. Warranty, without warranty, it's a transaction level difference. Credit period, no credit period, it's a transaction level differences. Difference in the enterprise, size of an enterprise, depth of assets of the enterprise, risk taking capability of the enterprise. So these are difference in enterprise. Okay. So now, when I do the functional analysis of the SSC vis-a-vis the comparables, I will be able to identify whether there are any differences in the transaction or in the enterprise. If I don't do functional analysis of the comparables, I will not be able to identify the differences. I need to identify the differences between the controlled transaction and uncontrolled transaction. By virtue of rule 10b3, I need to identify the difference. If there are difference, the next question that I need to ask is whether I can make a reasonable accurate adjustment to the difference. If my answer is yes, that I can make an adjustment, then it is a comparable. If my answer is no, that I cannot make a reasonable accurate adjustment, then it is not a comparable. So the portion of adjustment will take when we do the economic adjustment in the second part of the session. So this rule 10b3, right, now all the three rules when we see rule 10c2, rule 10b2 and rule 10b3 gives us a guidance in terms of what should be our approach while doing the transfer pricing analysis. Now let's look at each of these things, specific characteristics. And what is the importance of this in terms of doing the transfer pricing analysis?
specific characteristics to be uh, uh, characteristics to be associated associated vis-à-vis -vis the property to transport or services provided. So these I need to first identify what are the specific characteristics of property transfer or services rendered. So if I am transferring, so I've given an example here from the New Zealand Transfer Pricing Manual that an alkaline battery would sell at a premium to a standard zinc battery, uh, zinc carbon battery because of superior quality of alkaline battery. So I am looking at what is the characteristics of the product or what is the characteristics of a service. So I am rendering a service. So I am rendering a software service, can I compare that with an ITS service? It cannot because there is a specific characteristics that I am going to compare. So, so these characteristics could be in terms of physical feature of the product, it could be in terms of quantity of or volume of trade, it could be in terms of brand intangibles. So it could take any feature depending on what kind of services. If it is a service, then skill set of the services, depth of knowledge in terms of performance of services, various aspects those would come there. In case of products, it is more easy to identify this. It is more easy to identify this, what are the specific characteristics of property transfer. And then you can easily compare that with the specific characteristics of an uncontrolled transaction. This becomes more important in a cup method, especially if I am doing a cup method, comparable uncontrolled price method. This is the most important part that I have to play. The importance of this particular parameter reduces as we go through the GP and NP based methods. So GP based method like CPM and RPM, NP based method like PSM and TNN. So the importance of this reduces. The OECD earlier commented this is a very simple example. The question is can you compare a toaster and a blender? Can you compare a toaster and a blender? Can you compare the price of a toaster and price of a blender? I cannot. Give, leave comparing toaster and a blender if there are different capacity of toasters, even that price I cannot compare. Right? If there are toasters with different functionalities or different uh, brands, I cannot compare. The next question they say is, can you compare the gross profit of a toaster and a blender? Can you compare the net profit of a toaster and a blender? Possibly yes, because the when I am looking, selling a TV or a fridge, the margin that I may keep may be very similar. The functions that are involved in terms of trading that, doing that activity may be similar. Suppose I am a distributor, the activities that I am going to do is warehousing, keeping the inventory of that, timing my purchases, timing my sales, giving discounts to customers, doing the marketing and doing, say in certain cases, sales promotion activity or post sales activities. So the function for a toaster and a blender may be, blender may be same, but it is not, the, the price is not same. So the specific characteristics become more important when I am applying a price based method and it gradually reduces as we go further and apply the profit based method whether a GP based method or NP based method. It doesn't mean that in a GP based method or NP based method you totally ignore the product. The product functionality you cannot still be completely ignored but you will look at the situation whether the it, they are in the broad industry segment and then you can say that look the industry segment is same, the supply chain of those products is same and the value that is created at different supply chain points is same and therefore the functional comparability is same. So if I can demonstrate that then a different company also could be comparable in terms of that. Suppose I am looking at the computer hardware industry, so I will say that different category of products of hardware may be very similar profit generation, the supply chain may be very similar, so I can do that in a comparison. But that I cannot compare with a TV or a fridge because the market dynamics may be very different for selling a computer hardware and FMC, a fast moving consumer product like a, uh, a TV or a fridge. So the market dynamics may be different, the size of market may be different, various other parameters may be different. So specific characteristics as a part of my functional analysis, when I am doing my uh, analysis, I will know, have to note down what are the characteristics that I am transferring, in, what are the tra uh, characteristics of property transferred, what are the characteristics of services rendered, and vice versa, what is received and what is uh, property received or services received. This need to be documented as part of my transfer pricing study. This is also given in, as a part of Rule 10D requirements. So we need to document this. Again, for this, to import, where, where I am going to look at this is first is your agreement, your invoices, and your related documents connected with it, which will give an insight into what are the products and services that have been transferred or uh, provided to the related parties. So, property and asset is the same. Yeah? Property, property is a 
broader or wider world than asset. So property will include because uh, we can take understanding our understanding from section 214 definition of capital asset where it says property of any description. So the Supreme Court said property of any description is a very wide word and anything that you can own can be treated as a property. So the asset also will be property will include an asset. Goods property will include an goods. So if I am purchasing a capital asset, so that also can be treated as a property transfer. So capital asset is good to property is equal to this property transfer store? Yes, it will be included. Yes. So, as I said, depending on method, this slide deals with that, depending on method, the intensity of the first parameter, specific property transfer, will change. In certain cases, as I said, in cup method, it is more important. As we proceed further, the importance of this parameter slightly reduces. So sometimes when we are using the profit based method because the specific characteristics parameter is slightly uh, reduced in those contexts, we try to broaden the search and try to look at a different products if you don't get the same products. So I am doing a <coughs> search <coughs> for comparables in a particular segment, particular product and you don't get a comparable of the same product, you try and do a search of a product which is similar to that. So when I am doing this broadening of a search that OECD transparency guidelines provide that when you are trying to find out different product but with same functional similarity, you need to see what is the impact of product differentials on the price or margin. So that is the one point that you have to be kept in mind. You can broaden the search if you use a profit based method and you can try to take a different set of comparables dealing into different products but you have to keep an overall mind that whether there is any material difference which will impact the price or the margin. I have just highlighted certain case laws where there was a litigation in terms of uh, what, what kind of character, in terms of specific characteristics, what kind of cases we have seen. So, if you see one of the decisions of Trimax industry where there was a sale to A and sale to non A as well. And the question was whether sale to A and sale to non A were uh, to be taken as comparable and adjustment can be made based on the internal comparable. The revenue choose to select internal comparables and make the transfer pricing addition but based on difference in specific characteristics though the product was same the difference in specific characteristics of the transaction the tribunal distinguished it so the tribunal had that the TPO has adopted the sale price attributable to non A on small quantity now this is a volume so volume by ignoring the price quoted by the asset to HA for bulk and regular sales the variable adopted by TPO for making comparison are functionally different and therefore comparison is erroneous. Similarly, the TPO has overlooked the basic difference between FOB and CIR, this is transaction level differences, while comparing the sale price attributable to A as well as non A. While comparing the sale price in case of non A, the TPO has ignored the factors like deployment of additional capital and risk involved. So, here we see that they have gone into the characteristics of what is the product. Though the same product was sold to both A and non A because there was a difference in volume and there was a difference in certain parameters, they have said that we cannot compare this. So like this, though the product may be same, sometimes it may still not be comparable because there could be specific characteristics of that product which could create a distinguishing or differential factor. Now if you take us, you try to extend the same example, say 90% of sale is to A and 10% of sale is to non A. The question is because of this difference in volume, whether it is impacting the price, the answer will naturally be yes. The next question that we have to ask is whether for this difference can I make an adjustment in terms of uh, say volume discount or something else. If I cannot make an adjustment, it has to be rejected by applying rule 10 d 3 If I can make an adjustment, then I will take it as a comparable. So the rules very clearly, rule 10 d 3 clearly guides us in terms of this particular set of facts and how are I going to approach the uh, comparable. Similarly, you find in case of uh, work limited, where they give 10% differential. Now, how 10% is arrived at is not been stated. So, it is possibly the ad hoc basis or what the associate must have claimed in tribunal felt that it is justified because the uh, German technology was superior than the, uh, in that particular case, uh, German quality parameters were superior in that case compared to the parameters laid in on in India. Similarly, in the case of Oracle BPO, they said brand 
is an important factor and branding has to be kept in mind while determining the uh, functional comparability. So you find that these kind of situations, these kind of cases have dealt with these parameters which we have to keep it in mind and uh, suitable circumstances can be used. Okay. Next we come to the FAR analysis, function, asset, risk. The economic concept of arms length prices, there should be fair return for the function performed asset employed and the risk assumed by each party. So when there are multiple parties in the group which are doing certain roles and today because of globalization there is a huge amount of synergy because of global groups they are able to operate at a very large scale and there is an interdependency in their operations. But at the same time you cannot ignore that there are different countries and the territorial aspect has to be kept in mind in terms of what profit you are disclosing at what particular place. That is why we have the arms length principle. So every compensation can be attributed to the function, asset and risk undertaken in that particular transaction. So this is what the comment would say, this is what the rule would say. So these three aspects, one has to keep it in mind that, that we have to do it. So what are the things that we have to look at when I am doing this analysis? The, the, again the OECD would say that you look at what are the parties actually doing and what are their capabilities. So when I look at functions, what are the parties actually doing and what are their capabilities, whether they have capabilities. So in the, in, on the paper you are saying that there is an agreement that Indian company will be doing R&D and you really find out that there is no person with that capability. Then there is a mismatch between the agreement and the actual conduct. Then whether it should be ignored. So as we go further, we will see in the contractual terms, I said this should be ignored and you should look at the actual contract. So the functional analysis, the starting point is your contractual term, but backed up with my adequate evidence in terms of what is the actual conduct of the party. That has to be documented. So what is the what are the parties actually doing and what are the what are their capability? If you go back to our first example, three companies, C1, C2, C3. Right? We are saying one company is doing R&D, one company is doing manufacturing, one company is doing the marketing. Suppose Indian company was doing the R&D activity. Now the question that we would ask in that circumstances is, what R&D it is doing? How important is the R&D function in the overall supply chain or value chain of the company? Next, is it doing R&D on its own behalf or on someone else's behalf? Is it doing R&D for its parent company or its own behalf? So is it the owner of the IP? So these are the relevant points that we will consider. Next, does it have the capability? So are there trained enough trained people who can do this function, who can look at and control the R&D? So are there people who can take decisions in terms of what R&D should be done? If R&D is going off the track, are there people who can bring it back to track? Suppose there is a, a situation where there is an emergency and someone has to take a decision. Now where are these decisions taken? Who is the persons who are taking these decisions? So that has to be kept in mind in terms when you are looking at the functions performed. Right? When you come to assets, then again comes is where are those assets, who is the owner of these assets, whether it is leased assets or owned assets and who is using these assets. And when it comes to risk, the question is where are the risk, who is bearing the risk, who is bearing the upside and downside of risk and who controls the risk. So if I say the R &D, if you look at this again R&D function, the question is whether the Indian company is bearing the R&D risk or the foreign company is bearing the R&D risk. Suppose Indian company is compensated for its functions by way of a cost plus model and whether the R&D fails or R&D is successful is not on Indian company's account. Then do we say Indian company bears the R&D risk? We will say that the company who is funding this R&D is bearing and Indian company is only a contractual R&D government. Similarly, we find as we go further, we will see in case of manufacturers, in case of distributor, there could be various business models where the risk is allocated to a different party and it could be diverse or alienated from the functions that are actually performed. So that aspect has to be kept in mind and that has to be documented based on the agreement and the actual conduct of the parties, based on the agreement and actual conduct of the parties. Next important point is, if the Indian companies or the foreign companies doing a particular function, what is the economic significance of that function? What is the importance of that function in the entire value chain? That has to be precisely highlighted in your functional analysis. So if you are saying that it is 
the R&D is the most important thing and everything else is not relevant. Suppose it's a startup or a technology based company where R&D may be the most important part of it. And that needs to be captured in a functional analysis if there that this is the economic significance activity. Suppose in case, say in cases like Amazon where everything is outside India and Indian, com Indian part is only delivery. So then the Indian company is only doing delivery. It cannot, if we cannot say Indian company is doing the economically significant activity. Economic significant activity could be building the platform, uh, trying to bring people on the platform, trying to get vendors on the platform, ensuring that there is a seamless experience of the customers. So that is done say outside India, then you need to understand and attribute proper functions to the respective parties. Especially in case of technology based companies, this becomes more relevant. And if you see recent trend of decisions, at least uh, who are interested in this Transurprising and international taxation should treat at least three to four recent decisions. One is Nokia, one is Daikin, and one is Mastercard. Though they are in the context of permanent establishment, but in all these three decisions, functional analysis is the key aspect on the basis of which a decision is taken. So if you look at Daikin, the case was where where the Indian company Daikin Air Conditioner there was an Indian company which was distributing the air conditioners. So it was purchasing air conditioners from the Japanese welding company and selling it to the Indian customers. There were certain direct sales which were happening to the customers in India. The SSC's contention was that for those direct sales, Indian companies only providing support, coordination and support. It is not really doing marketing and getting the contracts. This is what the transfer pricing FAR analysis of the Indian company said. In the FAR analysis of the Indian company, it said Indian companies only providing the support services. On the actual analysis, the officer found out that the functions in case of the direct sales, the functions of Indian company are not actually restricted only to support but goes beyond that. So he asked certain relevant questions. Who does the marketing for these direct sales? From where did you get these orders? Who met the customers? Who did the price negotiation? And he, the officer has found out that there were even small sales as 25,000 rupees. And how could a foreign company directly contact a customer for 25,000 rupees of sales? And there were huge sales also. So, on the analysis, it was found that the far of Indian company is not sufficient, which is not reflecting the true characteristics of what the actual activity is doing where the functions are not properly brought in. Because of this, the conclusion was that Indian company is doing complete price negotiation, marketing activity and others for its foreign parent and therefore it leads to permanent establishment of foreign parent and foreign parent is accordingly liable to tax in India. So now here you see is the FAR analysis is defective, which is not properly capturing the essence of what is the actual functions performed. As I said, you need to see what is the actual functions performed, what agreement is saying, what is the actual perform functions performed. Agreement should be backed up by your actual contact. If agreement is not backed up by your actual contact, it will have to be ignored and actual functions performed will have to be given weightage in this. So that, so similarly there is a case of Nokia as well as Mastercard where this FAR analysis is discussed in very detail though these cases are in the context of permanent establishment but they are applying the transfer pricing principles to determine the permanent establishment to do the attribution of profits. So transfer pricing is not just restricted to international transaction it is much beyond that which is something which we have to keep it in mind. Now if you see the Titans case also if they had done capture the FAR adequately and demonstrated that for these additional functions also I am remunerated properly applying Supreme Court decision in Morgan Stanley there, was, there would have been no additional attribution to permanent establishment but which was not there in the transfer pricing study of this I am just trying to highlight that when you are doing the FAR analysis you need to keep this point in mind that what are the activities which are actually done what is the actual contact and what is the capability of the person who the organization which is doing and what is the economic significance of that particular function in the entire supply chain or value chain what we call.
So functions are yeah, assets. Again on the assets, when the assets are deployed, in certain industries the assets may play critical role in terms of the business drivers. There could be industries where assets really don't play a critical role in terms of the business activity. So if I see a service industry, the, the importance of asset is reduced to an extent, especially the infrastructure asset, the human asset may be more important there. Eh? So I need to, we need to identify what are the important assets that are driving the business. It could be intangible asset, it could be a tangible asset, it could be a human asset. So these human asset is more difficult to capture and document it. But at least the intangible assets and tangible assets will have to be documented as a part of your functional analysis. And you need to answer certain relevant question, whether it is owned asset, whether it is leased assets, who owns the asset, who has a right to exploit it, whether there is an intangible presence or absence of intangible. These aspects have to be brought into picture. The intensity of asset is also one of the parameters of comparability. A vastly different asset combination, you cannot say that company A is compared to company B because if there are vast differences in the asset itself, that itself is one of the parameters of inclusion or exclusion of a company. So that also has to be kept in mind. Then we come to risk. Now risk is something which uh, uh, is a most ignored area in the power analysis. You don't find whether it is from the SSC side or revenue side in adequate importance to this is given. Uh, mostly because it is sometimes difficult to identify, difficult to document, difficult to translate this into a number in terms of how I am going to do this analysis. So, Risk is present in every business transaction. Risk is the, what we say, is the uh, uncertainty in a business transaction. And person who is taking the risk of that uncertainty should will also have to bear the risk and reward of that particular thing. So what we said, an upside or downside of a transaction will go to a person who is bearing the, uh, who is bearing that risk. Now how do I identify this and how do I document this? There is a detailed commentary in the uh, OECD guidelines in the 2017 OECD guidelines, they have incorporated this and brought in a very detailed guidance in terms of a risk. Uh, so that, that is something which one can look at. So there are certain parameters. First, you identify that in a first in a business transaction, what are significant risks? What are the risks that are significant? Suppose it's a manufacturing that the, the the manufacturing activity may carry significant risk, capacity utilization may be a risk. The investment into a plant may be a risk. If it's a technology based industry, technology going absolute may be a risk. If it's a human based, human uh, resource, human based industry, human resource based industry, then the employees have, retaining the employees may be a big risk, manpower risk may be a big risk. So, if it's a finance industry, banking or insurance industry, organization of finance itself will be a very big risk. If it's a fast moving goods industry, the market risk, the product risk may be higher in terms of you being able to satisfy the consumer needs. So the different industries will have different or different kind of activities will have different amount of kind of risk. So I need to say what are the significant risks in a my uh, related party transaction that has to be identified. How do I identify this? Suppose I am talking of a credit risk. The question is who is bearing the bad debt? Is the Indian company bearing the bad debt? Is the A bearing the bad debt? So that gives me an indication who is bearing the credit risk. Similarly, foreign exchange risk. If Indian company, the billing is in dollars, then Indian company is bearing a foreign exchange risk. So like this, similarly say, uh, contractual risk. Is, do I make a provision for liquidated damages? So then I am bearing the contractual risk in terms of what the agreement provides it. So the, again, the agreement is the starting point for us to understand where is the risk line and who is assuming the risk. Then I need to determine uh, based on this, what are the significant risks and who is assuming the risk? Step 2 is who is assuming the risk based on the contractual terms. Then we need to go and see that based on the functional analysis and actual conduct, whether what are the contractually stated risks, whether they are assumed in actual conduct. Say for example, if you take go back to the first example of R&D, Indian company is doing R&D activity, right? But it is entirely funded by foreign company and all the decisions in relation to R&D are done by foreign company. Then we will say Indian company is not bearing the R&D risk. R&D company is being taken by someone outside India who is funding this and who is taking all important decision, the most important decision to continue or stop the R&D, whether that decision is to be done in India. Similarly, whether to modify the process, add a new process, go in different direction in terms of R&D, that is there. Similarly, if it is a manufacturing activity, that is associated with manufacturing, 
what to manufacture, when to manufacture, how to manufacture, who are the persons who are deciding this. If there is a contract manufacturer or toll manufacturer in India, but all manufacturing decisions are taken outside India, then the risk is outside India. And the upside and downside of that risk also should be attributed outside India. And India should get an assured return because it's only a limited risk provider, manufacturing service provider, and it is nothing more than that. So those kind of things that has to be done into the analysis. So I need to identify what are the risks. I need to see contractually where are these risks situated and who is assuming this risk. Then I need to do a functional analysis and see whether the conduct and the agreement are in line. If they are in line, then it is okay. I need not go further. If there is a difference in them, then we need to reallocate the risk based on actual conduct and appropriately factor that into pricing of a related party transaction. So this has to be kept in mind when I am doing a risk analysis. There are certain examples I have given from the commentary, one can look at this. Okay. Just to give a highlight that how I will structure my functional analysis, what are the important things I will look at the analysis when I am doing my TP report. So suppose if there are four kinds of manufacturers, what we generally say one is full fledged manufacturer, licensed manufacturer, contract manufacturer, tool manufacturer. So in the first two categories, the manufacturer himself takes a decision whether he should manufacture or not manufacture. Whereas in the contract manufacturer and toll manufacturer, the different in the toll manufacturer, even the raw material is provided by the principal. Okay. So in contract manufacturer, he will buy the raw material and do it, but he is always contractually obliged to follow the instruction given by the uh, uh, by the principal. So in third and fourth category, I am not taking any risk in terms of how much to manufacture. I am going to get an assured return for my service which is manufacturing. So the risk of contract and toll manufacturer will be much different or the function of contract and toll manufacturer will be much different from full fledged or licensed manufacturer. So if I see two extreme categories in toll manufacturer, he doesn't have to take any decision how to manufacture, when to manufacture. He has to just follow the instructions of his principal. So in his functional analysis will be much different than the functional analysis of a full fledged manufacturer. The full fledged manufacturer, when you are drawing his functional analysis, you will say, yes, the production planning is done by the full fledged manufacturer. But if I do a toll manufacturer's functional analysis, I will say production planning is not done by me, it is done by the principal. So that has to be captured in the uh, functional analysis. The general tendency what we see is every manufacturer is treated as same and the funding functional analysis will not make any difference between this category and that category which leads to defective functional analysis and give rise to cases like Daikin where your functional analysis is not proper. Then intellectual property, who owns the intellectual property, who takes the risk of developing, investing into the intellectual property, material, raw materials, who owns it. So if you see the last category, the toll manufacturer is least bothered about the purchase function. The goods will come is at his place, his job is to run the machines and convert into a finished product, that's all. So he can only expect the return for converting say a cloth into a shirt, which is decided that if you manufacture so much of shirts, I will give you this much of an assured return. He need not bother on anything else. Right? But if I go to the different categories, they will have to take a decision whether to manufacture or not to matter, what material to purchase, from where to purchase to cost negotiation in terms of material purchase, try to reduce the purchase price, increase the purchase price. So in first three categories, there is a risk that if the material price goes up, the profit will be depressed. Whereas the fourth category will not have that risk. So my risk analysis will capture this and say that in case of my case, I am a toll manufacturer, I don't take any risk of the upside or downside of the material uh, movement, price movement. So when I do this, I need to capture this in my functional analysis. Similarly, scheduling, production scheduling, what to manufacture, what not to manufacture. So in third and fourth category done by principal. Then I look at selling and distribution function. As I said, in third and fourth category, again this will not be done. It will only be done in the first and second. Based on these functions, your risk will also be changing. Uh, in case of last category, there are no risks. In case of first category, all risks are there. In case of second category also, majorly the risk is there. Only R&D risk is not there, otherwise all the risks are there. In third and fourth category, the risk reduces. So when we do our TP study, as a part of my documentation, as a part of our documentation, somewhere we need to bring in these aspects, somewhere we need to understand that what is the business process of the uh, uh, company or the SSC and we need to bring in these aspects as a part of TP study. If we don't bring in this as a part of TP study, the FAR will be defective. Suppose it's a toll manufacturer and we have not, or it's a contract manufacturer and we have not brought in this as a part of functional analysis. 
the processing officer is going to compare us with the full fledged manufacturer whose return will be completely different with the contract manufacturer. Second, once I document this as a part of our going and changing that in an appeal is going to be very difficult as the matter moves forward to CIT Professor Tribunal, then disputing that my TP study was incorrect would lead to unnecessary complications and unnecessary uh, litigation on that front. So this has to be documented at the beginning itself in terms of at least in the first year when we are doing the analysis this needs to be seriously documented. Similarly, in terms of distributors, there are various categories. I have talked. I have listed here three: limited risk distributor, normal risk distributor, enterprise distributor. There are another two categories that are there, but they call as service providers, agents who do only marketing and get commission, agency commission, or marketing service support service provider who don't even do the marketing but do the coordination activity. So the returns in each of this, in agent again you could have a normal agent and a Dell Catering agent whose commission will differ because there is an additional function in Dell Catering in terms of credit risk is taking, in terms of collection function is performing which a normal agent would not perform. So these again have to be somewhere documented in the DP study to say that what is the characteristics that has to be, that is there in each of these particular cases. So this is the part, these are three important parts of the functional analysis in case of the assessee uh, vis a vis the related party that we are going to bring in. In case of vis a vis the related party we are going to bring in. Now, the second stage of functional analysis, there is one more contractual terms, I will come to that. But second stage, the same FAR analysis, I need to transpose this for the second stage. The second stage is comparison between controlled and uncontrolled transaction, assessee and the comparators. How do I do that? Naturally, we are hindered by the availability of data. In case of, in case of first analysis, I am having the data, so I will do it. But in case of second analysis, there is a situation where I am hindered because I don't have the adequate data to do analysis of the comparables. That limitation is there. No one can deny that limitation. How much that limitation is there with us? The same amount of limitation is there with the revenue. To some extent, they are better placed because they can get additional information by issue of 133.6, but we cannot do that. So we have to say that based on the data available with us in the public domain, how am I going to do analysis of the associate vis-a-vis the comparable? Or how am I going to do the functional analysis vis-a-vis the associate and the comparable entities? So, so there are certain ways that we can do it. One that naturally the annual report is the starting point in case of a comparables. That is the data. Don't just rely on the data which is there in the databases. We need to go to the annual report and see what is the information which is there. It could be one year annual report, it could be two year annual report, how much are required that should be there. Today enough uh, uh, websites and technology is available to download the annual report which is not like five, seven years back where we were facing the difficulty. Today the available data is much better compared to what used to be earlier. So, so my starting point of analysis of the comparables is the annual report of the comparables. In this annual report, there are certain areas at least we can get certain amount of information. It could be the director's report, it could be management discussion and analysis in the director's report, notes to accounts, revenue recognition policy and in certain cases even the auditor's report. So at least these five areas we believe that gives good amount of information at least to make a prima facie view in terms of what is the functional analysis of the comparable. Auditor's report, director's report, management discussion analysis in the annual report, notes to accounts and revenue recognition policy. So we go to revenue recognition policy to give me an idea in terms of what is the revenue recognition of the associate. So if the revenue recognition is the comparable, suppose I am a cost plus entity and the revenue recognition of the comparable will say that it is based on time and material. I very well know that it is taking the risk of pricing, it is taking the risk of contract and other things. Whereas I am a cost plus entity, that very clearly says that there is a risk differential. So if you see the risk adjustment today, the revenue is rejecting it, the tribunal is rejecting it for the reason that SSE has not brought anything on the record to say that there is a risk differential. But we can bring out these things from the data available in the report. That is something which we have to keep it in mind. Whatever limited is available, which is available with me, that is available with revenue. There is no additional data with the revenue that we need to worry. At least in the context of once the assessment is done, though he may collect the information from 136, he has to give me as a part of natural justice, that information will be available with us. So, that can be done. So, director's report can give us information, management discussion analysis can give us an information, the uh, information notes to accounts can give us an information. Take for example, if I am doing an export activity, 
right? So I need to be sure that my comparable is also doing export activity. And this information we can readily get either from the PNL or from the foreign exchange earnings which they are liable to disclose and pass from notes for funds. And if we, do, if we should not ignore this information, we have to factor in this information in our analysis. Many times you will see that these kind of information are not factored. Similarly say, I am not doing any R&D, but I know that comparable whether to identify whether the comparables are doing R&D. In the MDA, the uh, MDA, the information of R&D expenditure is given. Many times the notes to accounts will say that as a claim deduction in the section 35, it is recognized by DSIR. So many information may be available. The availability of information much improves much uh, for the listed entities especially which are listed in PSC and SC, you will find that information is much better because they would have done huge amount of declarations to topics and will get captured in the various websites like money control etc or even in the databases. So this information has to be harnessed and used for our purposes. See the, the, the point we have to note is that databases are made for stock markets. They were never made for TP purpose. We are using those databases for TP purposes. So we need to customize that data for our use. For that, we need to look at annual report and additional information which we may find in various places. If we ignore this, then our far analysis will be defective. And the kind of comparables that we select and the revenue selects, then there will be a defective leading to unending litigation, possibly a couple of rounds going in to, to and fro, being a football and to, uh, from here to there. It will not really add value to the analysis. That analysis has to be captured when we are doing the uh, transfer pricing study. So once I have done my functional analysis, I need to apply these principles to the comparables. How to apply these principles to the comparables? To apply these principles to the comparables, I have to adopt the filters, what we call as the filters. The filters are designed based on the functional analysis. That has to be kept in mind. Generally we will find based on the experience that ad hoc filters are adopted which have no relevance to the case on hand. If I am doing an export activity, I have to apply an export filter. If I am doing a purchase activity, you may look at the foreign exchange expenditure filter rather than export filter. So, if I have done the functional analysis, I have jotted down what are the important specific characteristics. Now, to find out comparable with the same characteristics, I need to say that what could be an adequate filter. So, if I am doing a trading activity, I am going to say that even I will apply a filter of say 80%, 90% trading activity. The comparable should have minimum of that much of trading activity. Right? So apart from comparing the product, I need to also look at whether the trading activity is there. So this has to be captured in terms of filters. The filters have to be designed and have to be kept in mind, though certain filters will be common, related party filter will be common for all cases, because the comparable has to be uncontrolled, so that is given. But when we are designing the other filters, when we are deciding the other filters, we have to keep it in mind that these are the specific properties or this is the functional analysis in my control transaction. I want the same functional analysis in my uncontrolled. So for that, what is the important parameter? So if I am doing a trading activity, one aspect is important is the product similarity, which I can get to know from the annual report. Second aspect is that the main revenue should be trading revenue. Third aspect should be that if my SSC is not having major marketing expenditure, the comparable also should not have a major marketing expenditure. So I can use a marketing service expenditure filter. And if I am exporting, then I will look at the comparable also exporting. So like this, I will try and identify that these are the functional analysis of my comparables. Based on these, I have selected four or five filters. And those filters then I am identifying or applying on the database. And based on the annual report of the comparables, that should give us a reasonably good kind of comparables that we can then use in our analysis and which we can defend when the assessment comes. So there are various things that are there, turnover filter is there because this is a difference in size that is there, no doubt this is a litigation issue, the department says turnover is not relevant but it is an accepted principle that turnover is relevant, now you have Delhi High Court, you have Bombay High Court, you have Karnataka High Court saying that turnover has to be kept in mind when applying the filter because that it is an enterprise wide difference which has to be captured. Then you have export sales filter, if I am doing export activity, I need to look at the export activity. The flip side when I am doing an import, should I compare only with companies which are doing import activity. Salary cost filter, relevant for service industries, which we say that in case of a service industry, the salary cost, the, 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 I mean the companies which are having very low level of salaries, may really not be very comparable, may not be comparable because either they might not be doing 
the, uh, they may not have adequate human resources, they may outsource the services or there may be a good amount of automation because of which the salary cost is lesser. So that has to be kept in mind. These are some general filters that we use, on-site revenue, offshore revenue. If I am doing entire activities offshore, I should not compare with on-site, the reverse of that also. R&D cost, whether the compare, I am, when I am not doing R&D, whether the comparables are doing R&D. Reverse way, I am doing R&D, comparables are not doing R&D. So I need to look at the R&D cost. So these are some filters. These will have to naturally be customized for each case, depending on what activity you are doing. The databases today provide enough tools for us to apply these formulas into the search matrix and bring up the company. This can also be done manually, you can look at the annual report and do it. Depending on what kind of search you are doing, what is the importance, one can look at this. So, I have done the functional analysis of the SSC vis-a-vis the related party. I need to transpose that into a good kind of a uh, functional analysis for the comparables by applying good filters and doing qualitative analysis of the annual report to find out additional data. So once we have done that, we should get a good kind of comparables. Then we look at contractual terms. Contractual terms have more, uh, much higher impact, especially in case of a cup method. Uh, slightly lesser when we go to the other methods. But it is an important point that has to be kept in mind in our analysis. The starting point, as I said, is the return agreement between the related party and the associate. Uh, when you come to the second step in terms of doing the analysis vis-a-vis -vis the comparables, unfortunately this information will not be available. Uh, this is a sad part of it, but anyway we have to live with it because we will not have the information what is the contractual term before the external comparable with the third party. That information will not be available. So we can't help on that point, but at least from the point of contractual terms of the associate with the related party, it needs to be adequately documented at what are the contractual terms. Contra starting point is written agreement, supplement that with the actual content. Now if the actual content is different or the agreement has not been honored or the, it, has, like a, it has been treated like a sham, in those cases the contract will have to be, agreement will have to be ignored and actual contract will have to be given the importance. OECD guidance gives certain examples of that. For example, the agreement doesn't, in case of a distributor, limited distributor, the agreement doesn't talk of anything of advertisement, but the distributor goes and make a huge investment in the uh, uh, expenditure on the advertisement, which is not compensated by the uh, principal. So that is a something where you have not, you, your conduct is different from your agreement. And in those cases, the revenue will be within its right to ignore your agreement and make an additional attribution for the marketing activity that you have done. Additional compensation can be expected for the marketing activity that has been done. So that can be taken, uh, that can be done. So in cases where there is, uh, in cases where there is no contract at all, no agreement at all, I agree that is not a suggested situation because any third party in a commercial world, if he is contracting, he will try and identify his financial and commercial uh, transactions and document it. No one will keep that point open and now it is not a time where you just based on the oral agreement you do a transaction. So there is no, it is not a good situation for us to have a situation that there is no agreement with the related party. But in those cases where there is no agreement with the related party, the OECD comment will provide that you look at the actual contact and the actual contact itself has to be treated based on the functional analysis has to be treated as the terms of contract and the effect should be given to that. Look at the last name of this example in determining the degree of comparability with company B's uncontrolled transaction with company C and its controlled transaction with company A, the difference in volume involved or in the two transactions, uh, volume discount or the regularity with which these services are provided must be taken into account. So based on the contractual terms, what is the volume involved, what is the volume discount that is being given should be considered, that is what the UN transfervising model says. This point I have done that in case of external comparables we will not have the data and we have to adopt a vigilant approach and see the actual content. Conditions prevailing in the market, that is the fourth, fourth point of rule 10 d 2 That what are the market conditions, they give 
certain examples in rule 10 b 2 itself geographical location its size regulatory law and government orders cost of labor and capital level of competition nature of market wholesale retail etc overall economic development so these are certain another other aspects that have to be kept in mind when i am doing the functional analysis uh, the, as i said in the beginning the business strategy part which is there in OECD commentary is not there in rule 10b uh, 10b2 but that should not make a difference because overall analysis, function asset risk, right with the market condition should take care of that. Uh, only thing is, the OECD specifically says that in case of business strategies like market penetration strategy, the losses in initial years, if they are compensated by profit in subsequent year, that should be honored. Okay. So there is something additional which is there, but with the overall financial and commercial relationship what we talked in the beginning, that should be taken care of, that should, that should not really matter. Now coming to market condition, this could be certain cases where it is very important. Uh, important point that you have to keep it in mind. Geographical area, like if I am doing an export to an African country and export to a developed country, the pricing and market conditions are different. Government policies, say for example, ban on a quarter. So my purchase price when there is a ban on a quarter and a purchase price when there is no ban on a quarter could be very different. Especially in a commodity industry, say pulses, etc., you can find a good amount of control by government in terms of what would be the transaction. If you see agriculture commodities, your MSPs, minimum support prices, could influence the pricing. So these are certain factors which could be unique to a certain industry, have to be captured in this. So, if you are looking at say this kind of situation, say India is exporting to country A and country B, country A there is no government regulation and no ban or no other things, but as country B there are certain stringent measures in terms of what import is there, what is the pricing other things, the pricing to country A and country B may be very different. And you cannot then say that price to country A where there is related party and price to country B where there is unrelated party will directly compare it. We have certain decisions also as we go further we will discuss. But this is something which has to be kept in mind. Cost of labor and capital, well known situation. The countries are shifting their productions to low cost countries and there is a location saving that means just because it is located at a particular place, you have a location saving. Uh, if you see Indian scenario, the government or sorry, the revenue had made on certain locations additions for location saving and they said the, the profit that the government, the US companies earning because of shifting their services or manufacturing facilities to India should be taxed in India. So earlier if I am manufacturing in US, I am manufacturing at $500 because I have shifted to India manufacturing that in $300. That $300 may actually be at arm's length but you have, the US company has saved $200. Right? So the revenue was saying that this $200 of saving should be given 50% to India and should be kept 50% to US. So that was also in certain cases it has been done. So that has, uh, if you see the latest UN commentary as well as if you see the OECD model, India chapter of the UN commentary, they have discussed this aspect. Now when you are doing the analysis, you need to see that is there a profit for location saving. Second question is, is the India adequately compensated? So if there are third parties who are already factoring in that location saving and giving a pricing, the question was if the same manufacturing was done by a third party whether you would be adequately compensated for that. So when I am looking at $300 and profit earned from that $300, I will look at the comparable who performs same or similar functions, say for non, for uh, third party unrelated uh, uh, principles who are outside India, say I am manufacturing shoes for Nike and if the third party is also manufacturing shoes for Nike or sorry, for Adidas and if the profit margin of both of them are same, then we can say that the location saving is not having an impact on pricing. So, in, and in various situations, location saving might have been transferred to the customer because in the end market, the pricing may be impacted by demand supply and that saving whatever has happened may not have been transferred to the end customer. So, depending on the situation, that's, that also could be one of the points that we have to keep it in mind. Level of competition, nature of market, monopoly versus a very spread uh, competitive market, the pricing will be different. If the SSC is having a monopoly kind of a situation, his pricing will be different. If there is a fierce competition, the pricing will be different. So these factors also have to be kept in mind by doing the analysis. So one very interesting case where the sale was made uh, to A in Thailand and to uh, non-A in Vietnam. The same product was sold and the sale price to A was 10 and the sale price to third party is 20. 
So if flush, first flush it will appear that why not just take 20 as a comparable and make an addition to sale as a to an E. Okay. But the question was whether the geographical market in Thailand and Vietnam is same. These two countries are neighbors, fall in the same region. So the revenue is the market is very similar. The market, just because India and Pakistan are neighbor, we cannot say the market is similar in India and Pakistan. So, so, so the criminal looked at these principles and they dealt with this. So initially, if, if the same table is given to anyone, would it say that the comparable can be taken, the Vietnam can be taken as a comparable to say to Thailand in the A. So, the geographical differences, market conditions, size of the market, the trouble has the price at which the product is sold in one country, country cannot be compared with the price at which the same product is sold to another country because of impact on account of geographical differences, country specific demand supply factors, market condition, regulations, government orders, etc. The, so this was very clearly dealt with in this particular case and the uh, tribunal held that Though there is a sale of identical product, it will form the basis of determining the arms length price. But essential prerequisite is whether for the difference, whether reasonable accurate adjustment can be done. The TPO and CAT assumed similarity of the markets and economic conditions and had made adjustment only for volume discount and credit offered a small adjustment to credit risk. They had completely ignored the disparate economic and market condition in Thailand and Vietnam and had made no adjustment for the same. So what is the important point is? the economic and market condition in Thailand and Vietnam. Mere geographic contiguity, mere being neighbors or similar area is not a relevant factor. It does not mean that there is similarity in market and economic conditions. As I said, India and Pakistan being close doesn't mean the market and economic conditions of both of them are same. How can the sale price in a wholesale agent in two different countries be comparable? And also if you go into this decision, they have discussed certain government restrictions which were there in terms of particular that in that particular product, how it was influencing the pricing, so that has been done. So the point is that when I'm doing the analysis, when I'm doing the analysis, you have to keep this factor in mind that when there is a sale of the same product to two different uh, to related party and unrelated party, and is there an influence on pricing because of market, it could be because of foreign currency and various other factors that has to be kept in mind, that has to be kept in mind. So this is the fourth factor that has to be factored. Specific characteristics, FAR analysis, contractual terms and the market conditions. The TP report that we prepare when we are doing the functional analysis, we need to keep these four factors in mind and capture what are the significant parts of these as part of our analysis. As I said, in the first step, we need to capture it for the related party vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the Indian company and second step, Indian company vis-a-vis -vis the comparables. So this has to be part of our analysis when we are doing the keeping study. So with this, we have covered the first part and I think we will take a break and then start the economic adjustment part. Yeah. Any questions if you have on this, we can take now or we can take all the questions at the end also. So whether it is a cut method or it is a CPM, RPM, TNM or PSM, 
there is no adjustment for PSM naturally because it is just an allocation of internal profit and there is no adjustment for 6th method the rule does not provide an adjustment for rule 10 AB because it is again based on certain parameters which where the adjustment may not be required so for 4 methods CUP, RPM, CTM and TNM the adjustment is provided in the rule the stage of adjustment is also provided in the rule that has to be kept in mind the adjustments that we are going to do for the differences you don't find that the adjustments are done on a regular basis it is possibly one of the most neglected area in the transfer pricing study either because it is or if, the, if you look at revenue they sort of have an allergy to adjustment if you make a positive adjustment which is improving assesses arms length price then they are going to reject it saying that we are not going to accept this adjustment for various XYZ reasons why adjustments are ignored at many a times is First, it may be difficult to identify difference. Second, if I have identified difference, what is the methodology to make an adjustment? What is the stage of making an adjustment? Are all something which are not very clear. Second, availability of data has been the most biggest challenge while making an adjustment. Okay. So when we don't have reliable data, Rule 10C says that what are your assumptions? The assumptions that you make, are the assumptions reliable? So, if I make an assumption, the question is whether it is a reliable assumption. So, when doing an adjustment, naturally these assumptions come into force and we have to ensure that these assumptions are reliable. But it does not mean that adjustment are substitute for poor comparable. If you cannot take a poor comparable, make it adjustment, make it a good comparable. That is not the case. So, if I say that I am trading into uh, cars and there is someone else who is trading into mobile phone, I do not think you can say that I will bring it at par by making an adjustment. That is not what is meant. We require reasonably good comparables where my functional analysis matches at both the levels but at the same time I do an adjustment for identified differences and eliminate those differences. So we will deal with these aspects in detail to identify what are the, uh, uh, what are the different kind of adjustments. So there are different kinds of adjustment that we have to keep it in mind. One is enterprise level differences. Two broad segment that the rule deals with is enterprise level differences and transaction level differences. As I said earlier, transaction level differences are the differences in a transaction, FOB, CIF, warranty, non-warranty, credit, non-credit. These are transaction level differences. This become, they become more important when we are looking at a cup method. Because in those cases, every small difference in a transaction can impact the price of the product or price of the service. The enterprise level differences are in the difference in the enterprises which are undertaking control transaction or the enterprise which are taking undertaking the uncontrolled transaction. Like working capital differences, it is the enterprise level differences. When you look at the methods RPM, CPM, TNM, to some extent the transaction level differences get nullified. For example, with warranty, without warranty would get nullified at net profit level because though the sales is with warranty, the warranty expense is debited to P&L account. Therefore, the net profit it is much similar level because the warranty cost becomes part of the uh, your operating cost. So, the ENM will take care of certain transaction level differences. I am not saying all transaction level differences, but certain transaction level differences will be taken care under the ENM. Very interestingly, only in case of rule, uh, in case of resale price method, the the rule also provides for making accounting differences. That accounting differences is not provided for CPM or TNM. For the uh, in only in case of RPM, the rule says we will make difference for if the derived price will be adjusted further for transaction level differences, enterprise level differences, also the difference in accounting practices. In case of RPM, because we are comparing at the gross level, for example, sales less rebate. One may account has sales less rebate, one may account only the sales and rebate may be part of P&L account. So this is an accounting difference which will impact the gross margin because rebate will come post the GP uh, line item. So it is going to come below the GP, therefore the GP get influenced by accounting difference. So there could be similar differences, say warranty without warranty. If the sale is with warranty, GP is higher but NP is at the same level because warranty expenses hit to your P&L post the GP. So this accounting differences is relevant in uh, the RPM because you are comparing the GP. Whereas when you come to CPM or TNM, TNM you are really coming below the line where this would possibly in most of the cases get nullified. The warranty with warranty or without warranty, the sales rebate with sales rebate, without sales rebate. These accounting differences in most of the cases 
should get the nullified when you are looking at the TNN. But in case of CPM also, in both in case of CPM and TNN, the comparison what we are doing, if you look at CPM, it says you will compute the gross profit margin of the SSC on direct and indirect cost. You will compute the gross profit margin in uncontrolled transaction on the same direct and indirect cost. So the parameter is direct and indirect cost which is the same level. So what components are included for the SSC, I will include the same components for uncontrolled transaction. So any difference will get nullified there because the base becomes same. Same way for TNN, because the base is same, the differences, this kind of accounting differences should be taken care in that way. That is only the reason, that is precisely the reason, only in case of RPM, the method today prescribes for adopting the, uh, even for accounting differences. Sometimes the differences may be timing difference, like depreciation rate or policy, they, they may impact different years. With multi-year data, this time difference is possibly taken care. Earlier we had this issue that this may not get taken care in one year data, but possibly with multi-year data, this time difference can be case. Permanent differences cannot be taken care, that have to be adjusted. If there is a difference which is permanent difference, right, a depreciation policy difference which is a permanent difference in case certain cases, where you are writing it off immediately or something of that sort, in those cases that will have to be taken care by an adjustment itself, by an adjustment itself. So other kind of differences uh, like R&D expenses capitalized and write-off. So they are very difficult to make an adjustment for this kind of a situations. So if say that comparable is writing off R&D expenses or capitalizing R&D expenses therefore its profit is high whereas I am debiting in the p and account therefore my profit is less. In those cases you will have no choice but to reject those comparables because there is no mechanism to make an adjustment for such kind of permanent differences. Though at a very larger canvas of 5 to 10 years it may nullify, but we are not doing comparison at that level. So therefore, if there are differences of such kind, in those cases you may have to reject the comparable and very difficult to translate that difference into a numerical adjustment in that given time frame that we would have. This is again what OECD would look at it, very similar to what we have. There's just some observations that I put. Okay. Now coming to rule 10 3 And first point that we need to consider is how am I going to do the adjustment? Now rule 10 3 says if there are no differences which materially impact price or margin. So the difference would be such which materially impacts the price or margin. If the difference is something which does not materially impact the price or margin, it can be very well ignored. And in all probability our arithmetic mean concept or the median interquartile range concept will take care of small differences. Because there could be some positive difference in some company, negative difference in some company which will possibly get nullified when you are looking at it. So the, the thing that I need to look at is, is there a difference which is materially impact the price or margin of a controlled transaction vis-a-vis -vis uncontrolled transaction. Then yes, I make a reasonable accurate adjustment. The next question that we have to look at is, this is just a chart of what we have discussed. Yeah. So whom should I make an adjustment? We are saying that adjustment should be done. So should the adjustment be done to tested party, that is say the taxpayer, if you are looking at the taxpayer, or should I make an adjustment to the comparables, or can I make an adjustment to both in piecemeal to bring both at same level? Can you do to tested party, to the comparables, or to both? So what does the rule provide? Only comparable? Or can I make it to tested party also? Cannot make it to tested party. So this is some very important aspect that we have to take care if we are doing an adjustment in our transfer pricing study. One is to whom I do the adjustment. Second is at what level I do the adjustment. Because for different methods, the adjustment is differently provided. For example, if I look at cup method, rule 10 b one it says identify uncontrolled transaction. Adjust the uncontrolled transaction, adjust the uncontrolled transaction for transaction or the transaction level differences or enterprise level differences. Look at rule 10b, uh, 10b1b for RPM. There it says look at your sales price to unrelated parties. 
identify normal cross profit in uncontrolled transaction, reduce the cross profit from the sale price, the derived price is adjusted to account for transaction level differences, enterprise level differences or the uh, accounting differences. Rule 10C, uh, sorry, Rule 10B, 1C which deals with CPM, it says that identify the direct and indirect cost for services rendered or property transfer to the related party, mark up that cost you have to identify the gross profit margin in uncontrolled transaction, identify the gross profit margin in uncontrolled transaction, adjust the gross profit itself for the difference in transaction or enterprise level differences. It doesn't capture the accounting differences in, uh, the, in, in case of CPM. In case of CUP, we don't have a concept of accounting differences itself, because accounting differences itself because you are comparing the price. There is no concept of accounting difference. Then you come to TNM. So TNM says, Look at the net margin realized when you are selling it to your related party. Identify comparables. Compute the net margin having regard to the same base as you have used for your tested party. And just that net profit for accounting or sorry, transactional or the enterprise level differences. So the cup method says adjust uncontrolled transaction price for differences. The RPM says adjust the derived price for differences. The CPM and TNNM says you adjust the GP and NP for the differences. Now the different methods are using different methodologies. The, so we have to be sure where and how I am going to do an adjustment and where I am going to do an adjustment. So next thing that I will look at it is that can I make an adjustment to tested party or to uh, controlled transaction. If you look at say, <coughs> if I am looking at say, there is a sale. Suppose I have sold on CF basis to related party and FOB basis to unrelated party. Now what does CUP method say? CUP method says identify uncontrolled transaction. So my FOB sale of same product to third party is an uncontrolled, comparable uncontrolled transaction. Cut. Now should I make an adjustment to make FOB and take that to CIF or can I remove insurance and fight in my transaction and bring it to FOB? Right? Got the point, right? So, I am having my sale which is CIF and the comparable sale which is FOB. So, I have to ideally, it is most logical and easy to compare FOB to FOB. Right? It is very easy to compare FOB to FOB because insurance and fight anyway are paid to third parties and they are charging it arms length. So, there is, a, there is no doubt on the levy of insurance and fight. There is no benefit my A is going to get on out of the CIF sale. What it is going to pay is the FOB value and insurance and fright even if it pays it to me I will pay to the third parties. So there is no benefit that I am getting out of CRC. So if I am to apply a method very easily then I will remove insurance and fright, bring my controlled transaction to FOB and compare that with an FOB of the uncontrolled transaction. That would have been more easy to do it. But look at the way rule has worded the adjustment. It says identify an uncontrolled comparable transaction adjust such an uncontrolled transaction for enterprise transaction level differences. So there is no flexibility in the rule. This is now how the OECD deals with it. But our rule is differently worded. So our rule is just looking at a situation that we are going to make an adjustment to the, uh, to the uh, uh, uncontrolled transaction. Same way, look at say RPM. If I am looking at sales, say suppose the related party sales is accounted with rebate and rebate is debited to PNL account separately. So sales is higher compared to uh, uh, other unrelated parties cases where those unrelated parties might have accounted without rebate. Suppose we know this transaction and we have a third party transaction. Is it not much simpler to do an adjustment excluding my sales minus rebate and compute the GP which is more easier for me to do it which is more easy because that data is available to me. Now, the rule does not envisage this kind of situation. The language of the rule unfortunately tries to give a direction to say that you will make an adjustment only to unrelated, only to uncontrolled transaction cut and not to the associate, to the tested party. All the four rules read that way. This, is, this has been one of the issues which is there that can you make an adjustment to the tested party itself or should you make an adjustment only to control transaction. There are certain decisions which have dealt with it like in case of power or petrol oil the tribunal took a view that you can
can make an adjustment only to the comparable uncontrolled transaction. You cannot make an adjustment to the tested party of the assessee. You cannot make an adjustment to the tested party of the assessee. Whether this view is correct, whether this approach of the terminal is correct. For example, let's look at ENM. It says net profit realized by the enterprise from an international transaction or a specified domestic transaction entered into with an associate enterprise in compute is computed in relation to cost, sales, assets, etc. So I have to compute net profit realized from international transaction. We more more of TNN, which is a more a method of default that we use today. Right? So what I have to compute? I have to compute net profit from international transaction. A net profit, suppose I am taking a cost, if that cost is influenced by abnormal external factors, is it a net profit from the international transaction? Or is it a net profit from international transaction which is having a taint of abnormal external factors which are not in my control? So, the adjustment today is provided in sub clause 3. Okay, can I say that in sub clause 1, the language supports that when you are computing the sales, when you are computing the cost, when you are computing the margin, that cost, that sales, that margin should be actually from international transaction which is uninfluenced by abnormal factors. Right? Should be uninfluenced by the abnormal factors. Same logic you can apply for CPM. It says you will compute direct and indirect cost in rendering services, direct and indirect cost of property transferred. So, should I not take the direct and indirect cost which are actually incurred in rendering services or should I take the direct and indirect cost at the complete level which is including, including certain abnormal factors. For example, if I am having underutilization of capacity, if I am in underutilization of capacity and my profit today is vitiated because I am not able to utilize my, profit, my facility properly, can you say that net profit is from international transaction or do you say this net profit is from international transaction but it is tainted and vitiated because of the external factors that is the capacity utilization which is impacted because of various factors. Now this was one of the arguments taken before the tribunal in the case of Elston Thermo India Private Limited that for making an adjustment to the tested party I need not go to clause 3 because that method was dealing with the TNM. As we saw there are three clauses here. Uh, clause 1 talks of net profit from international transaction. Clause 3 talks of an adjustment for differences. Adjustment for differences. Right. So can I then say that the rule 10b1e clause A itself is sufficient for me to make an adjustment to the tested party. I need not go to the somewhere else. I need not go somewhere else to make an adjustment. I need not go to clause 3. Then the question would arise, what is the purpose of clause 3 then? Why do you have two separate clauses? So, the possible answer to this is that apply the more reasonable approach because as I said, transfer pricing, ultimately everything I need to convert into a number and there is a data limitation that we are having. In that circumstances, to give a reasonable and fair interpretation, we can argue that Rule 10b1 talks of, rule, sorry, Rule 10b1 E clause 1 in case of PNNM, that clause 1 talks of adjustment to the tested party. Clause 3 talks of adjustment to the comparable uncontrolled transaction. That means in the initial I made a statement that can we make adjustment to both to bring them at par? Can I make an adjustment to bring both at par? Instead of taking associate tested party to the comparable or comparable to the tested party, there could be circumstances where I make an adjustment to both and bring them at par. This should be a fair and reasonable interpretation. Try to give us some flexibility. If you go back to the first example of FOB and CIF, it is very, it, it, it's very logical to say that if my sales price is CIF and comparable uncontrolled transaction is FOB, what should you compare? If you ask anyone, they will say compare FOB to FOB, remove insurance and fright, that's the most logical thing to do. So, we should try to give this reasonable interpretation to say, look at the purpose, you the purpose is to make an adjustment and look at and make it comparable. The purpose is not to reject everything. If you say you cannot make an adjustment for a difference, then I have to reject a comparable, not reject an adjustment, I have to reject a comparable itself. Suppose I am saying that there is a difference in capacity of A e and B, A e is the associate, B e is the cut, 
Now, once accepted that there is a difference, you have to either adjust or reject the comparable. You don't have a choice of rejecting the adjustment itself. Now, the department and some of these decisions have taken a view. If you cannot make an adjustment, reject the adjustment. But Rule 10b3 says, if you cannot make an adjustment, reject the comparable. That is something which has not been taken care and argued in, in, in these cases, which needs to be brought in before the authorities to say that, look, you need to find out a mechanism to make a reasonable and fair adjustment. You need to make this work by taking comparables, which are good comparables, make adjustments which are reasonable and fair, either to tested party or either to cut a comparable and control transaction, bring them at par and care. If you don't do that, you have to reject a comparable, which is an unworkable proposition because already we have deficiency of comparables. Okay? So, this view of Aristothermo, no doubt these both contrary views will have to be tested as they proceed further to higher courts. You will have, have to test it as they proceed further. But this needs to be seen in a, this, this is a very good approach to say that I am going to make an adjustment either to tested party or to comparable depending on the facts and circumstances of the case and that is permitted by the law. This is one important aspect that we need to look at. So there are certain decisions, TP is such a thing that you have decision for, a contrary decision for everything. So, it, you, there is no shortage of decision, you have them in abundant supply like uh, the rain gods did in Kerala. It's the same kind of decisions, we are flooded with decisions on a daily basis. Right? So you have decision for both the views. No doubt these will have to travel upwards and we will have to see how these decisions have been given meaning uh, by the higher courts. Next up, what are different kind of adjustments? Some important adjustments we try to look at and say numerically how we try and or what are the certain important aspects that we should factor in while looking at this, we should factor in while uh, doing this adjustment, uh, these adjustments, whether it's risk adjustment, capacity, certain adjustments at least we have fair amount of judicial decisions, good amount of uh, I mean, uh, development in terms of how we are going to do the adjustment. No doubt, again, as I said, there are contrary views at both the sides, but we should try and see that in circumstances this claim should be made. Another important aspect is, if possible, always do this adjustment at the earliest stage, either at the TP report side or at the time of assessment, because more and more we are seeing that when this matter come up to traveller, they say that adjustment has not been made before the lower authorities and therefore we are not going to look into this when it is coming to traveller. So if you really are looking at, there is a difference which needs to be adjusted, try to make it at the earlier stage, don't leave it at the last stage because then it becomes more and more difficult to get this adjustment at the higher forums. Coming to risk adjustment, As we have seen that the, the analysis, the power analysis that you do, risk is one of the important factors that we need to consider when we are doing the power analysis. So we need to factor in that into the analysis. This risk adjustment has been a bigger issue, especially in cases of uh, the captives which are working on cost plus model. We are seeing there is a no chance of a loss or toll manufacturers who work on a cost plus model, they are given an assured return and there is no opportunity of a loss. In a real commercial world, there would, no one would give an assured profit margin. They may give an assured sales, but they will not give an assured profit margin. So in those circumstances, there have been various cases where a claim has been made to give a risk adjustment and you will find again, they are listed down decisions in favour and against, you can refer them, you need not go into each of these decisions. We are just going to certain important aspects that where the quantification part comes, where once I have documented it as a part of my FAR that there is a differential in risk, how well quantified. There are few cases where quantification has been done. Again, uh, some of these are ad hoc. Naturally, we won't agree with this proposition. Uh, in, there was a case of Sony where ad hoc 20% was given. Philips, they said, you take the bank rate and the normal uh, uh, PLR and take the difference as a risk adjustment. But there was a case of a Motorola where they said that 
CFE, capital asset pricing model can be adopted for the purpose of risk adjustment. So this is a very interesting uh, first of it kind of case. We don't know what happened when it is demanded back, but a couple of, this is a decision of I think two years back, three years back. So where they have given saying that CAPM is a reasonable model which can be adopted for computing the risk adjustment. And if the SSC is given a computation, the EO can look into this, the matter was demanded back to take it. In the Delhi terminal also gave a direction that you get an expert's opinion to say whether CAPM can be used to compute the risk adjustment. The Supreme Court in Bhakti Editor had said that if there are technical matters where there is no competency within the department, they should take an expert opinion. There was a circular post that, that if there are matters where there is a technical expertise required, the department should take a opinion of experts and factor in that opinion while doing the transfer pricing analysis or other analysis. So there is a situation where we can say that an expert should step in and look at these things because surely these are something which the Assessees may not have complete expertise in this or the department may not have complete expertise in this. So there could be situation where experts can give their opinion. There's another interesting decision though not, lost, not listed here, Henkel Edition. There was a calculation of price under the cup method. And by calculating the price under the cup method where the sale was to A and sale was to non-A, in that circumstances it says in case of sale to A there is no credit risk because monies are received and there is an assurance that monies will be received. Whereas in case of non-A's, the SSC is bearing the bad debt risk and in case of sales to A, the SSC is not bearing the bad debt risk. So based on the bad debt return off and provision for bad debt by divided by sales, a ratio was found out which was 1% of sales and 1% deduction was given to the either while calculating the cup method. So these are certain approaches that we should keep it in mind that okay there is a possibility of doing it in this way. Similarly we find that if there is a contract risk and there is a liquidated damages paid, there could be some ratios that one can work to say. So this, these things, at some places it can be there, you should factor it. Another important aspect which is there is, the revenue or the terminal today is taking a view that SSC has not demonstrated that there is a risk differential. Now how do I demonstrate that? Naturally there is a limitation of data when it comes to third parties. But within the availability, available framework, can I demonstrate that there is a, there is something that I can say that there is a difference in risk. For example, to see various listed entities as a part of uh, management discussion analysis, they need to disclose what are the risks that affect the business. Not all companies do it, but you find good amount of companies giving the details of risk that is impacting their business. So this could be one way to say that look, there is a comparable which is taking a risk, there is an assessor which is not taking a risk. Then say for example credit risk. So if the comparable has made a provision for bad debt and I'm not, and in my case my series to A which is giving me an advance. So then I should say that there is a risk which the comparable is taking and I am not taking. So this I have to demonstrate. Similarly, if you look at revenue recognition policy and in the assessees is a cost plus model which will naturally say there is a fixed price contract based on so and so I will recognize the revenue which reflect that they don't have an assured sales and it can be coming only based on certain uh, situations where the the land, the, the, the particular parameters specified in the contracts are reached, which will mean that they have a price risk or execution risk of the contract. So these are differences we should highlight in the our submissions to say that look, these are the differences. I am a, see, I am a situation, I am an SSE who is not carrying this risk, whereas the comparables are carrying this risk. And you should give me some rebate for this differential. So how I compute it is the next part. First I need to demonstrate it that there is a risk. Now when you go to the computation, if it is some parameters like cup method where Henkel ADSU kind of ratio can be used, if it is uh, the, the DNM method possibly we'll have to bring in CAPM or some other model with statistical tool that we'll have to bring in which department doesn't understand. If they don't understand it is good because then we can say that I should get an adjustment. So this is about risk adjustment. They have just given the citations that one can look at. Okay. Capacity utilization adjustment is another area which is highly litigated both for service industry and manufacturing industry. We all know based on our costing principles what we have been taught in CA final that there is something called as break even. Right? So if my fixed costs are there, variable costs are there, semi-variable costs are there, up to a level of my activity 
and beyond a break even level i'll start making my every march every unit i that i manufacture starts contributing to profit but before that there's a something which will be uh, which will result in a loss so i am looking at my various cost in my pnl account which are split into fixed cost variable cost semi variable cost very difficult to identify semi variable cost because we are looking at the balance sheets so balance sheets will not give you this data fixed and fair, fixed also not very easy but we please can give some directions of hint from the balance sheet but not always in for the semi variable cost so i am i am going to look at this particular data now when it comes to manufacturing there is something that we may know that there is a machine which is going to run at so and so hour this is my installed capacity so i will know that if it is a car manufacturer this is the installed capacity if i am going to have double shift this is my installed capacity so this information can be available in case of the assc being a manufacturing entity many cases you can try and get the engineering engineer certificate chartered engineer certificate that what is the installed capacity what is the actual capacity there are various cases government regulations where you do filing like in gujarat you do a filing that this is my actual capacity when you are registering with the particular authority is there so there could be information available within the organization to say that this is the installed capacity actual production is anyway available with the financing statements so i know that what is the utilization level in case of the assc so that is in the case of manufacturing industry in case of service industry you have two situations one is your infrastructure and utilization i have 100 seats but only 50 are occupied but i am paying rent for 100 seats so there is a under utilization of infrastructure out of that 50 only 25 may be deliver balance 25 sitting on the bench so the 25 so this i have to identify so i may get the floor plan which is saying that what are the number of seats available then i know the actual number of employees who have been there in the organization from the payroll so i can make out something that what is my actual capacity what is my capacity in terms of who are actual occupation then out of this how much is the billable and how much is non billable entity so non billable may be various season there are no projects available and it is a startup phase the company is in the recent phase so i should be able to say that there is a capacity under utilization based on this dollar data that is available to me another important aspect that we have to keep it in mind is if there is captives who are under obligation to render exclusive services to ae can you make a capacity utilization adjustment with this in the case of google they gave capacity adjustment utilization capacity capacity utilization adjustment in assessment as 67 uh, tribunal order but there is no discussion on the aspect especially in case of captives and where you are exclusive service provider you have created the entire capacity at the behest of the principal and they you cannot say that principal has not given me business it is a something which is incongruous with your main objective that i am an exclusive service provider to my principal so that may be slightly difficult but in case of other situations where i am rendering services to both e and non e and i am having workforce of both kind of a situation and i am equally doing it there could be a situation that i should be able to get this adjustment similarly if i am importing raw materials manufacturing and selling in domestic market and there is no demand various reasons suppose i am doing manufacturing of petrol cars and suddenly there is a ban on petrol cars i am doing manufacturing of diesel cars and there was a ban on diesel cars by the supreme court so my sale goes down so there could be various factors which can affect me in economic terms where my capacity utilization is suppressed so i can do it i can find out what is my capacity and i should document this as a part of my tip report next aspect assuming i am operated at 60% can i make 40% adjustment to fixed cost or i need to see what is the comparable utilization level also right because we have to make an adjustment for difference and assuming that the comparables are at 100% may not be in correct proportion so how do i identify that what are the level of adjust what are the level of operating or all the by the comparables are operating here again you be in a bit of handicap because the data may not be available in case of manufacturing entities uh, though not mandatory now but still lot of companies give the data in the notes book on what is the installed capacity and what is the manufacturing capacity there could be some information available in case of service industry this is ruled out kind of a situation where you, this information would not be available then what i do so can i then say this difference is there and all the comparables i have to reject because in every comparable this is a lack of information or i then say that rule 10c says that you make certain assumptions are your assumptions reliable okay now there is a handicap there is no doubt that there is a handicap in the case of genesis integrating bangalore tribunal says that you assume that there was a uh, 
uh, industry report which said that the average capacity utilization is 80 percent in case of software companies and underutilization is 20 percent and the SSC demonstrated that his utilization was roughly 60 percent so the tribunal held that okay you take 80 and 60 and 20 percent reduction so can I then say that look this information is not available in the context of comparables therefore I have made my best effort I have taken the industry average though it may not be accurately correct but I have taken the industry average and give me this difference you may at least give me this difference of this so attempt will have to be made there is a lack of data of the comparables unless the TPO is asked to issue a 133.6 and get this information this information is not going to be available in the public domain so we have to make an attempt to say that at least take the industry rate and say that I am at 20 I am at 50 percent industry at 75 percent you mean adjustment of 25 percent of the fixed cost as a capacity utilization adjustment this has to be <coughs> this could be one way <coughs> sorry this could be one way of doing it Again, here next question would be coming is can you make an adjustment to tested party or can you make an adjustment to the comparable? The same problem that we envisaged in the first part of the uh, presentation. It is more again easy to make this adjustment to the tested party because if you have identified the difference that this is 20% of a difference, <coughs> then I would say that adjust my fixed cost by that 20%. If it is 100 rupees, make that fixed cost as 80 and you compute, recompute my margin by taking as 80, making 80 as part of my operating cost. So you can look at that way of doing it. I've given certain decisions which have dealt with it. There are again contrary decisions also. Just a simple example to how to do an adjustment. Assuming you are going to a tested party. This is a simple example. You can go through it. It's there as a part of slide. Okay. There are two interesting decisions. One is in the case of Petro Araldite and in the case of Class India Private Limited and these decisions uh, have given their own mechanism of doing an adjustment they have tried to use the ratio of fixed cost to sales in case of SSE and fixed cost to sales in case of comparables transpose that ratio of SSE to comparables and rework the fixed cost of the comparables so you have to take the annual report, look at their fixed cost you find out the ratio of fixed cost to sales say it is at 80 and SSE is at 90 then you increase the profit margin of the comparable uh, sorry the fixed cost of comparables from 80 to 90 and do that in adjustment so certain parameters are discussed in these two decisions also you can try to look at these decision in the case of class as well as in the case of uh, petro Aralite. try to say that I will follow at least these you give me an adjustment as per these decisions which is statutory recognized by a judicial body compute the adjustment as per this and give an adjustment so there could be one way to say that I will adjust the fixed cost of the SSC based on the differential capacity and make an adjustment second some parameters are given in these decisions based on the fixed cost to sales ratio that parameter I will use and make an adjustment so this adjustment should be whatever it is documented in a way that you can uh, make a submissions before the authorities in a proper manner whether on the basis of adjusting the assesses fixed cost or adjusting the fixed cost of the comparables has guided has the guidance given based on these decisions and one should make a claim for the adjustment keep it in mind if you don't claim you will get nothing if you claim at least you will get something it's the old Hindi saying hati nahi to pooch is sahi so when you claim for hati you get at least pooch so something, something has to be done This is another interesting uh, situation. So, is there any way in which well you can make uh, capa capacity utilization adjustment in case of captive service provider? Captive has just said in case of a Google, there is a decision where they have given this, but they have not discussed the aspect. In case of captive, my personal opinion would be it is very difficult because what is the role of captive? Captive's role is that you are following the directions given by your principal or parent you are keep creating the entire capacity at the behest of parent because the direction of parent is create say 1000 seats you have created 1000 seats and another is you are having an exclusive arrangement that means you don't you cannot render services to third parties okay when these two aspects are looked into the question is who should bear this risk I am not permitted today, suppose I have 100 people who are on bench 
and I have a good third party contract. I am not permitted today to do a service to third party because my parent is saying don't do the service to third party. So therefore, who should bear this risk? Should Indian party bear this risk or should the parent bear this risk? If I just look at this saying that if it is not a parent and subsidiary kind of situation, if it was a third party, if it was an independent party, will independent party create a capacity and keep it on bench without there being assured return or assured volume of work? So it becomes something like a, the terms of contract are commercially irrational. The terms of contract are commercially irrational. So in those circumstances, we would apply the principle that the contract does not reflect the underlying reality, commercial terms and therefore it should be ignored. So I would feel in case of captives, where I would, I would an exclusively service provider to, my, to, to the parent company or principal, it may be difficult to claim capacity under utilization adjustment. One can attempt based on Google's decision, but uh, I mean, if you ask intrinsically whether it is correct, I would feel it is not appropriate. Then coming to this foreign exchange, as we have seen the rupee movement uh, in, in, in couple of years back, it stabilized before that it was an erratic movement, again currently there has been erratic movement. So the, the rupee movement impacts your profit margin. It could impact your profit margin in various ways. One, the, if you are importing material, if you are exporting it, it's okay because you are, then your realizations are higher or NP is higher. Okay? And when you compare with the similarly placed export company, if I am 100% export and comparable is 100% export, you both are, at, both are at the same level. But when it comes to imports, your material cost goes up and foreign exchange loss, either realized or restated loss, restatement loss, is hit to your PL account, therefore depressing your profits. So therefore, if I am importing materials and trans either trading into importing finished goods and trading, importing material, transforming it into finished goods, finished goods and selling in the Indian market and if there is a, there is no flexibility to increase the sales price, the foreign exchange is increasing my material cost and there is no flexibility to increase my sales price. This could happen because of various reasons, because there could be other companies in the same industry which do not import but source the products locally. So the foreign exchange fluctuation is not hitting them. It is not increasing their material cost or it is not giving rise to a foreign exchange fluctuation loss. So they are able to still sell it at the same price and in a dynamic market, competitive market, I will not be able to sell more than what someone else is selling for a similarly placed substitutable product. So in those cases, the, the, the loss is because of movement of currency. My E was selling last year also at same hundred dollars. Current year is also selling at same hundred dollars. But my cost has gone up from six uh, six uh, six lakhs to seven uh, sorry sixty thousand to seventy thousand for the reason that uh, six thousand to seven thousand because the revenue uh, the dollar has increased. So which is impacting my margin and therefore depressing my profit. The question is, if this kind of situation is there, can you make an adjustment for this foreign exchange fluctuation? Again, in the current year, because you have seen the currency moving quite a bit, this is going to depress profits of various cases. There are a couple of things that we need to think it, think before we really uh, make an adjustment. One, certain part of cost goes in the material cost itself, certain foreign exchange fluctuation goes in the material itself, and certain second part goes as a PL debit item as a foreign exchange loss. So one goes to material cost and we do an adjustment to material cost, therefore reduce the material cost by differential currency movement, assuming the graph of my AE price is same. So my AE price has remained same. My AE price has not increased beyond the inflation limit to say that the increase in material cost is not because of AE price, but increase in material cost is because of foreign exchange fluctuation. So that is something which I need to look at this point first. Second point, that why am I importing? E, am I importing because of restriction placed by my EE? Is it a commercial decision? Or there are certain factors which don't permit me to source these products locally. There is no substitute available in the local market. Say there is no volume enough to do localization of a product. There could be a situation where the same quality of product may not be locally available. There could be a situation where terms of contract mandate the import of product. So if there are circumstances which are beyond assessor's control and it has to import, it has no choice to procure it locally, 
then this is a factor that has to be kept in mind to do an adjustment. Next, is the increase in foreign exchange impacting the domestic player also? Say for example, my import is 50%, my comparables import is 0%. But, say for example, gold. Though I am importing and he is purchasing locally, the price of gold will be clearly effect, impacted by the movement of both the price in global market as well as the currency movement. Same for oil for example. Your movement in the price will depend on the currency. So the currency is already factored into, into the domestic raw material price. So then you cannot say you are differently affected and the comparable is differently affected. Because both of you are ultimately affected because his domestic procured say steel or oil or something else is already inflated because of currency movement. Then you cannot make an adjustment. So these could be some of the, this is just a, giving you an insight in terms that if you want to make an adjustment, these are the parameters that you look into this and you need to keep these points into mind while making an adjustment. Because this the fluctuation of currency is here to stay. We all know that, that there is a supremacy of dollar in terms of global trade. 60% of global trade happens through dollars. And I mean, if you see the Turkey kind of situation, where there is a sudden, sudden, uh, sudden fluctuation in the currency and whole economy is put in a difficult position. So that kind of situation can arise in future where the movement would be such that it will depress your profit in one year suddenly and that is nothing to do with your E relationship. It is the relation, it is only because of an economic condition which is beyond assessor's control and which needs to be factored into the transfer pricing analysis. So this, this has to be done. This particular adjustment has been accepted in couple of cases. One was Honda trading uh, corporation case where there was a situation where Thai Bhat had suddenly moved up and the purchase prices where uh, 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 accordingly metal costs had gone up. The sales prices could not be moved up because of confirmed sales order or, or various other reasons and there is a situation where market driven prices is not possible to increase the sales price. So the assessor was able to demonstrate that sale price has remained constant despite movement of raw material price upward from 110 to 190. So the tribunal held that adjustment can be given. Same way in the case of finance and legal data the systems where there was an abnormal movement in foreign currency. They gave an adjustment for the movement of foreign currency and that was suitable adjustment was given for the difference in uh, for the foreign currency movement. So there are a lot of decisions which have looked into this aspect. This can be uh, analyzed in a particular case, an adjustment can be thought of if the facts of that particular case uh, demonstrate that the real impact is because of currency movement and not because of the E relationship. So the adjustment will come from where the margins will ignore the forex impact. Yes. So suppose I am able to demonstrate that the comparables, there is no impact of foreign currency. Let's assume that kind of a situation. And in my case, material cost has moved up from say 100 to 110 because of forex. So I am going to say I am reducing the material cost by that 10 and make it 100. Therefore, increasing my profit. Is this only in case of abnormal movement of forex? Or? See, normal movement of forex. Yes, this year is a big hit. When we had movement from 54 to 66, we had a big hit. This year from 60 to 63 to 70 is a big hit. Because so most of the ITAT has uh, no, no, should not be a good example because they have export revenues. Okay. So their profits are going up. So this would be more in case of imports where your costs are going up, nothing to do with A, but because of the movement in currency. We not done the hedging or we have to hedging. So, so hedging also would be one more parameter. The question is if you have a natural hedge, like you have import and export both, so it's a natural hedge, it will take care, the so one will take care of other. So in those cases, we may not really not have a situation where you want to really make this kind of an adjustment. But where you have one-sided transaction, let's say only import and currency suddenly moved up, in those cases, the time available with you to plan an alternative is not there. The plan available, there is no time. Suddenly it has moved up, say four or five rupees. You cannot find out a substitute product in the domestic market immediately. Because, and you don't get that kind of a quality. So those could be situations where someone should analyze this and what is the impact of this currency in all the material costs, assuming my E prices are remain stable. So you need to look at these aspects and factor it. 
So this again, if, if these are this, these should be abnormal years like this kind of a year where you need to look at this kind of situation and say that whether it is reasonable to make an adjustment. Now again, if my comparables are also having similar level of imports, then you cannot make this because they would also be equally impacted by this. But if the comparable imports are lesser, then I can make an adjustment. If I am having 50% imports, comparables are having 50% import, then I cannot say that I will make this adjustment because foreign currency fluctuations hit me, but it will hit the comparable also. So either I will make an adjustment or find out a comparable which has similar level of imports. Working capital adjustment, this is at least one adjustment which is pretty prevalent. Uh, in terms of the video was giving it earlier without much difficulty they have suddenly stopped giving it there is a change of heart and you find that in recent years at least last one year they have uh, stopped giving working capital adjustment but it is natural that there is a time value of money which is accepted and department obviously uh, appreciates this aspect much more than anything else right because they want advanced tax earlier, TDS earlier so there is a time value of money if that was not there why should they expect us to pay advanced tax earlier they were three quarters now they are waiting four quarters for individuals for example so TDS remittances have to be done on a month on basis because you are collecting a huge amount in the beginning of the year so uh, so, so, so this one which was there earlier was pretty settled proposition that you will get this adjustment at least last one or two years there is a bit difficulty but again though revenue has been rejecting it you find that the tribunal consistently giving the adjustment even today and saying that this adjustment is a valid adjustment suppose I was making a comparison under cuff method and there was a credit period of 3 months and credit period of 6 months in ACL and non ACL. We will not adjust it. If you can adjust under a cup method, why not adjust under TNM? Right? So, this has to be done. So, there is a, a working capital differential which is there which can impact the margin in case of processy and comparable. OECD has given a detailed working of how this has to be done. The revenue has accepted this for many more, many years and this should be suitably available. There are certain challenges that we face. One is when you are using segmentals. Suppose the comparables are having segmental, how do you then bifurcate the segmental of the comparables into say suppose I am doing software development services and comparable is doing software plus ITS plus something else and I don't know how to segregate their receivables and payables to say that only for software segment is there. Again we have to make an assumption, take the receivables, divide it in the ratio of sales, take the payables, divide it in the ratio of cost and try to say that these are the fair assumptions. In allocation on this basis is a fair allocation. Do that and come to the uh, working capital receivable. Then PLR is there which we are taking SBA PLR which is again accepted proposition. One more issue which was raised is that you are taking opening and closing balances of receivables, opening and closing balance of payables. So which is again OECD had permitted, had given this in the formula. Revenue says we don't have day to day balance so how can we take opening and closing? Opening and closing are open to manipulation. Suddenly you will get advance at the end of the year on 30th March and your receivable, you will get an advance and therefore your working capital differential will change. All that said and done, in the given availability of data, this is the most best available information that is there in the public domain and that should be used and adjustment should be given. The, I have listed on again decisions which uh, where these aspects are discussed some cases where it has been denied also how you calculate working capital adjustment this is pretty fairly settled calculation there is not much in this now we come to certain other adjustment depreciation adjustment in the sense where the difference in depreciation to sales ratio of the SSC this is one adjustment which uh, the SSC is claimed saying that my depreciation is at a higher level when the comparable is a depreciation it is a lesser level Therefore, you give me a depreciation adjustment or compute the margins taking cash here, right? Excluding the depreciation. Now, the question is, can you say that depreciation adjustment, just can you on the basis of depreciation to sales ratio, can one say that the depreciation adjustment should be given? 
The, the most important point that we need to highlight in our submissions if you are making a claim for assess or if there is a difference that we have to identify is what is the depreciation policy of the assessee and what is the depreciation policy of the comparables. Again, in the notes to accounts of the companies, you will get what is their depreciation policy. It's a mandatory disclosure, so this information will be available. For example, I am writing off computers in two years, they are writing off in four years. So this information will be available. So that is one thing that if we are making a claim for depreciation policy on the ground that they are having a higher depreciation rate when compared to comparables, this information need to be brought onto the record to say that there is a differential in depreciation policy and that differential in depreciation policy has nothing to do with my e-transactions but it is impacting my profit. So either take profit before depreciation or give me an adjustment for that differential rate of depreciation and make an adjustment. Also, there are another other differential, I mean, difference of opinion between judiciary. There is a view taken in uh, case of uh, Sumi Madarasan, where the discussion was, can you look at depreciation in isolation? Can you look at depreciation in isolation? Or you need to look at depreciation with other connected cost of the asset. For example, repair and maintenance cost of an asset. Because newer machine will have higher depreciation, lesser repair and maintenance cost. Older machine will have lower depreciation, higher repair and maintenance cost. So you look at combined ratio. So if that is the situation, look at a combined ratio and say, based on this combined ratio, whether I am able to say that my depreciation rate is still higher and adjustment should be given. One way to eliminate this is to say that I adopt cash profit level indicator, it is before depreciation. That also has been accepted by various cases. Andhra Pradesh High Court has accepted that you can adopt cash profit level indicator and one can use that also as a one of these things. Uh, because what is there is we have FAR, function, asset and risk. So I cannot forget the asset in the functional analysis. So the depth of the function, the range of, sorry, depth of the assets, the range of the asset is an important aspect that we have to keep it in mind in the functional analysis. You cannot ignore the asset, you cannot ignore the asset in the functional analysis. So when the function, the assets itself, the class of assets is itself different, then in, we need to factor in that into the adjustment. Because the differences and the asset differences is an enterprise level differences, which again through 10 3 would permit us doing it. So that cannot be ignored. You cannot say that just because I am going to just reject this without looking into the analysis. There could be genuine cases where the rate of depreciation charge is much much higher compared to what is there, what is uh, charged by the comparables and the rate of depreciation could be much lesser. In fact, if you see uh, uh, a couple of quarters back when Geo started showing profits, there was an allegation that the depreciation policy of Geo is different from others and because of a much lesser depreciation it is showing profits and others are showing much higher profit because their depreciation rate is much higher and therefore they are showing much lower profits. So these are, I mean this is something which is accepted. I mean it's only an accounting difference which has to be factored in, this has to be highlighted and factored in. So if there are cases where this kind of situation is there, one can try and bring in this into its, uh, into the analysis and try to make an adjustment for those differences. Listed various kinds of decisions where you have there the certain uh, quarter reviews also have given those decisions you can refer depending on what kind of situation you are. So that can be looked at. I'm not highlighting each and every decision, but there are a good amount of decision on either side in these cases. This is one peculiar adjustment, and we see some cases in this. Uh, for this marketing function. So we have certain reported decision in the case of for say Pentair, Fund School, Henkel, Edisive. So if you look at Pentair, the same product is being sold to AE and the same product is being sold to non-AE. In case of a non-AE, I am doing a marketing activity whereas in case of a sale to AE, I really don't have to do a marketing activity. I don't need to have a sales function because there is an assured sales contract with the, my AE and AE I don't have to deploy any marketing persons to get the sales so I am getting order more easily for when I am looking at my AE sales but when it comes to non-AE sales I am looking at a situation where I need to deploy my marketing people I need to maintain that relationship with my customers and 
and when when it comes to A, it is only one company. But when it comes to non A, it will be X number of clients who have to maintain that relationship. Right? So the question is whether for this function which I need to be compensated or an adjustment should be made in my A sales. So in the case of Pentair, they took the marketing expense ratio divided by sales and said that it will adjust the cup price, the price at which it was sold to A to take, take this differential and make an adjustment. So actually the adjustment was made to non-A, so if non-A price was 100 and the marketing to sales expense was say 10, so non-A price was reduced to 90 and that 90 was then compared to the, uh, the price in the controlled transaction. So another way of looking at it that where this is a functional difference which is then translate, marketing is a function, so functional difference is translate into a numerical figure. So as I said in the beginning, it is important for us to translate every difference into a numerical figure. If I write a thesis saying that is a marketing difference, I don't have a number, it is of no use. It is not going to make any difference. No one is going to give me an adjustment. Ultimately, I need, ultimately I need to translate every difference into a numerical figure. And that is the effort that we need to do for a better analysis, better transfer analysis. Just a, uh, so this, this, this is one of the adjustments which has been done in uh, two, three decisions which I just highlighted. There could be a flip side of this, if you talk too much of marketing, they will say you are doing AMP function for A. So you have to be careful in terms of what balance you are going to draw, what adjustment you are going to do and how you are going to draw the balance in case of uh, this kind of a situation. This is again a unique adjustment, custom duty adjustment. Uh, the closely link to your import activity that we discussed when we were discussing the foreign exchange uh, fluctuation adjustment. In the case of foreign exchange fluctuation that we discussed, we were saying that uh, if I am having an import, then I will go to, and there is an impact because of foreign exchange fluctuation on the profits. Similarly, when I am importing, there is a custom duty levy on this. Some of this may not, basic basic custom duty at least, may not be available as input credit. The other duty may be available as input credit. The extent of basic custom duty, I, I, there could be a situation where I may be influenced, the profit margins may be influenced, the profit margins may be influenced, right. So, uh, just an example I have highlighted here that where your import co component moves from 2% to 50%, your material cost moves from 60% to 68% because of basic custom duty. Okay? Because the custom duty component is such that their import component is increasing and the material cost, material cost as a ratio to sales is increasing. Now, because of custom duty adjustment, because of custom duty component in material cost, can I then say I will make an adjustment or it is permissible in all cases or it is a commercial decision that you are importing the material and why should you make an adjustment? Pretty fair because you, you cannot say that I will make this adjustment for life now. In the first year, when I am setting up, in the startup phase, there could be an obligation to import because the market may not be developed, the suppliers may not be developed, I am not having enough infrastructure to put in a place where I am able, able to locally manufacture this, the raw materials or components, what are required. But as you proceed further, if you have not made any efforts on localization, then you cannot say that, and then you cannot say that I am going to make this adjustment on a consistent level. So if there was a Sony's case, then said this is a commercial decision and we should not, we cannot allow you to remove custom duty from the, or uh, your material cost and they said that this is a part of your commercial decision to import certain components and manufacture it. Whereas in case of Skoda, it said that I am in the initial phase, I don't have capability to do localization, my volumes are not such that I can manufacture engine locally, I have no choice but to import it. And when I am importing 90% of components, you cannot compare me with someone like Maruti who has only 10% or 20% of imports. My business model and their business model is completely different. Right? So then you should give me an adjustment. So these are two contrary views. So I need to, what points we discussed in the context of formation fluctuations. That what are your reasons for import, why are you importing, what is the commercial decision to import and what is the impact of that in your uh, uh, long term strategy. That has to be demonstrated, what is the localization trend going forward that has to be seen. So these aspects need to be factored in. So these are, this custom duty has been given in certain decision, in the, these decisions it has been given. In Sony's decision it was rejected, but this decision it was given because they were able to demonstrate that I am in the initial phase and I have no choice but to import the product. 
In case of local purchases, you are now liable to pay GST which is available as input credit. So the taxes paid on local purchases are offset and there is, that is a balance sheet to balance sheet item. Whereas in my case, the custom duty is a PNL item which has to be excluded because of differential discharge of duty. So in, certain, in these certain cases, these parameters were brought in and adjustment was done. The adjustment was done. So, um, these... You are talking from GST perspective? Correct. So, inverted duty structure. But inverted duty structure, the higher 18 percent of uh, your GST, there will be no BNL debit for this, it will be sitting in a balance sheet. So, there is no, it is not passing through the PNL. Now, inverted duty structure, I believe under the GST law, there is a provision to take a refund for it. So, Okay. No, but you, are, you may not be debiting, you will be still showing it as receivable as input credit in your balance sheet. You are writing it off. So in case you are writing it off, then it could be something where you can think of an adjustment. But if you are showing it as a receivable, either on the presumption that in future I will be able to take a refund of it or I may be able to take a future set off of it, in that case it is passing through the balance sheet. So I may not be able to take an uh, adjustment for that. But in cases where, as you say, you have to write it off because I see that there is no way I can get it. In fact, if you see, I think yesterday's newspaper, certain engine manufacturers are complaining to railways that my imports are suffering. I think, okay, it's the same case. So, and they have now made a recommendation that my thousand crores of inputs is going waste, I think. And you need to either reduce the input on that or I will have to pass on this cost to the railways. There is no other choice. No option So, I think it's just there in yesterday's newspaper. So this is an inverted duty structure which I mean I am assuming it is eligible for refund fine. It's not there if writing it off, then it's a good case to do an adjustment. They came for textile industry, they came for yes, textile industry in the GST region they come up for us. Okay. It's all RFP difference, we cannot use the same price. Correct. It's all uh, confirmed orders. You cannot change the sale price, you have no choice. And a subsequent legislation is changing your cost structure. So that's a very important point for which I should make an adjustment. Because I, when I gave the order, I have done based on the S parameters and suddenly the, the pricing has changed now because of a new legislation or a new levy or XYZ parameters which was not there. When I have entered into a contract and it is a confirmed orders and I cannot increase my sale prices for these. So then I, it has nothing to do with any transaction. Keep this in mind, it has nothing to do with any transaction. It is an economic problem which is there and an adjustment should be done for such kind of situations. Okay. So this is one of the other adjustment. So these are broadly the adjustments that uh, in which we see in a uh, regular case, some are regular and some are unique in nature. So some of these, there could be certain other kind of adjustments also operation efficiency adjustment in Toyota Kilos for Motors case or some other cases. But these are something, but the whole point what I am trying to say is you need to identify the difference through functional analysis, factor in those difference or capture those differences as a part of a trust pricing study and then those differences somewhere you need to convert that into a numerical figure. If you don't convert into a numerical figure and just write a theory on that is not going to help. You need to come up with some rational basis whether right or wrong it has to be a proposition has to be made that I am going to make this adjustment for this difference. In the absence of such a proposition the revenue is going to say that I am going to reject that adjustment. So this can be this can be thought of this adjustment should be factored in and uh, taken care. So these are all the economic uh, adjustments. If you have any questions or anyone wants to add any points, we can discuss those points. In case of unutilized capacity, wherein I have both AE as well as non-AE sales are there. I know at GP level I am making profit, but when it comes to NP, whatever I can sell, I will try to sell. Being a business guy, I, can, I want to sell whatever to sell, I can record. Correct. Price. So it may be a case that I am actually selling to non A's at a lower price than A's because I want to recover my fixed cost. Correct. Does a GP argument sells through? Does a GP I have the profit, but NP if you come, I am completely lost again. No, uh, so in these cases where you are selling to your A and non A, uh, then because there is an internal comparable available, 
You can ideally use the CPM applying direct and indirect cost. So because direct and indirect cost will remove this underutilization of capacity factor from your uh, uh, from your analysis. So you take direct cost, take indirect cost, which is only for production. So un so unabsorbed you will have to remove from that. So factor in that and do the analysis. Factor in those both and do an analysis under CPM. So that is much better way to defend the case rather than going to NP and making a capacity utilization adjustment. That can be an alternate argument if the department moves from CPM to TNR. Yeah. Any other questions? No. See, if the the if the rule itself, the rule 10D says that the things which are same. You need not have maintain the documentation in every year. Ideally, you do this FAR study in the beginning, in the say first year, for example. And if things remain same, same study can be utilized for the subsequent years. You need not maintain a fresh documentation. Only thing is, every three, four years, you try to understand whether there is any change in the business model, change in the business dynamics, or anything else which is impacting the business. If these things remain same, if these things remain same, the FR study which is done at the initial, uh, say initial year, that is good enough to apply that for the subsequent years also. That is good enough to be applied for subsequent years also. Only you have to see whether there is a change, any change which is there in the subsequent years. In that cases, we have to redo the FAR to that extent. Otherwise, you can utilize it. Uh, any company here selected as a company and that scenario of that company is getting changed. So, you are, see, what is the FAR of the associate? Okay. Now, the FAR with the, of the associate visa be comparable. When you come to FAR of the associate visa be comparable, you will have to go every year. Associate, FAR of the associate visa be the tested party, you can keep it. But FAR of the associate visa be comparable, you will have to evaluate the same thing for the comparable whether the comparable has remained same from the preceding year. If you now find that the comparable business line has changed, new products are introduced or new business line has started, in that cases, you will have to naturally redo that analysis for the comparables on, on a year to year basis. So in case of comparable, it is advisable to relook at the comparables every year because the circumstances may change. But in case of such is far, if the businesses fairly remain same, there is no necessity to again relook at a FAR for say at least three, four years maybe. You come across cases where the foreign A's have been considered as a tested party. Yes. Yeah, there is cases, there are important decisions where foreign A's has been accepted as tested party. And we have uh, one case going in tribunal currently where the foreign A was selected as tested party. So there are decisions which are permitted as See, the rule does not, the rule does not uh, say that you will test the margin of the associate. It says you will test the margin of price or margin of the enterprise. In the inter enterprise could be Indian enterprise or could be foreign enterprise. Only when you are taking a foreign, foreign E as a tested party, the question is the reliability and availability of data. Because that database may be available with the associate and that data may not be available with the revenue. So the revenue generally looks at those kind of cases and say that look, what is the guarantee that what data you are giving is reliable? What is there? So this that kind of question should come. But surely from the legal perspective, if you ask the foreign E as a tested party is an accepted proposition and there should not be any problem on that. Though practically it is difficult to convince them or department and others in terms of accepting that because of they will they start questioning the reliability of data. So, uh, thank you for uh, patient coming and uh, thank you. Close okay.